Hi, everybody, and welcome to Spring Lobby Weekend 2020. I am so excited to be speaking with you all virtually, uh, since those are the times that we live in right now, but that will not stop us from having a really engaging two days, both today and tomorrow, where we will learn about climate change and how we can advocate on this issue, even from our own homes. My name is Larissa Gil Sanuesa, and I work on the Young Adult Program here at FCNL, which means that I work with young adults all over the country as they organize and contribute to grassroots movements. I love my job. Um, FCNL, which is the Friends Committee on National Legislation, is a multi-issue, faith-based lobbying organization located here in DC. So on behalf of all of FCNL and particularly the Spring Lobby Weekend planning team, I want to thank you all for being here with us today. Our first priority, just like I'm sure that it is yours, is that we and our loved ones stay safe and healthy. Making the decision to move this event online was really hard and of course it made me sad because of how much time we have all spent preparing particularly those of you on this call that have spent months getting a group, a delegation together in your community. I want to thank you for doing that. But I am so impressed at how many of us are convening together online anyway, bringing our groups together anyway, to take important action while making sure that we do so in the most responsible and healthy way. Okay, so before we dive in, um, I do want to go over a couple things to make sure that we all know how best to communicate with the speakers uh, when they are presenting and with each other. This is still a conference of sorts, and we definitely want you all to meet each other and engage with each other as well. So first of all, I hope that you will be sharing this experience with your friends on social media. Use the hashtags, hashtag Spring Lobby Weekend, and hashtag act on climate. And if you do post, please tag FCNL on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, you are all probably watching this right now from either Facebook or YouTube. But if you are on our website instead, thank you for doing that. But I do suggest that you go to either Facebook or YouTube because that is how we will be taking questions from all of you when some of our speakers are presenting. If you use the chat functions on, like I said, both YouTube and Facebook, um, then we have a team of people that will be monitoring those pages um, so that they can see the questions that you have and make sure that you get your answer. Uh, at this point, I do wanna introduce you to the wonderful people that will be monitoring those questions. So first we have Annie Chirazi. Um, she is our events manager, and I think that she is going to be on Facebook. Um, right. And then we also have, hi Annie, thanks for being here. Um, and then we also have Bobby Trice, our program assistant for Quaker Outreach, who is going to be on YouTube. That's Thank right. you. Thank you, Bobby. So this is going to be our crack team that makes sure that um, all of your questions are heard and that we are participating as much as we can. Um, so at this point, I do want to take a moment to kind of shout out some of the people that are on the call with us. Um, if you are here and I don't say your name in a couple moments, let us know on Facebook or YouTube. Annie and Bobby can kind of jump in and uh, shout those people out. So, you know, I'll just start by saying thank you to schools like um, Mount Union in Ohio, Houghton College in New York. Um, we have also um, Wilmington College in Ohio. Annie, Bobby, do you wanna jump in with any that I'm missing? I know we have the Advocacy Corps members. Those are our community organizers that we hire here at FCNL. They're on the call as well. Anything from you, Annie and Bobby? Yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing Justin Yale tuning in from Virginia. Um, our coworker, Ashley Wilson says, woo, go Larissa. Oh, yay. <laughs> I'm seeing lots of people on the YouTube as well. We've got Katie Brislin sending love from Richmond, Indiana. We have folks from Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, all over the place. 
Good, and let's not forget that we also have people tuning in from the uh, Western part of the country as well. Um, people from Seattle, people from Las Vegas, Arizona, New Mexico. So um, thank you all for being here. If I forgot to mention you, there are so many of you here um, that I'm gonna go ahead and say this is a good problem to have, but in order to capture everyone that's on this, um, that's at this event with us right now, we do wanna take a sort of group picture. Um, so if you could all take out your phones because either you're watching this on your phone or it's right next to you, I know it. Um, and let's take a selfie, whether you're by yourself or you did manage to get your group together or you got one or two friends to um, join you for this. Get everyone in the picture and send that selfie to quakerlobby at gmail.com because we want to put all of those pictures together and kind of create a collage, our virtual group picture. So I'll go ahead and start by taking a selfie um, and to give you all time to do it as well. So here we go. All right, let's see if we can see that I just took this selfie. Can you see that? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Perfect. So um, I hope you are all doing that as well. Send that to quakerlobby at gmail.com. All right, so what does uh, the rest of today hold for us? Today we'll be together via this webinar, um, meaning again, Facebook or YouTube or the website, whatever you're looking at right now, you will just you can stay there until 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, that means that you don't have to move, you won't have to click on any other links or anything. Um, but what do we hope that you're gonna learn in those next couple hours that we'll be together? So a couple things. First, while I'm sure that you don't need to be convinced of this yourself, since you're here, we do want to learn how to speak to others about the urgency of climate change and why we must take action. We're also going to learn about carbon pricing, one solution to addressing the climate crisis and the legislation that we'll be focusing on today, you'll learn more about that later, um, and why we've chosen to focus on this particular solution. We will also learn about where we belong within the greater climate change movement. Uh, there are so many ways to advocate and make your voice heard. So we wanna have a conversation about where lobbying fits into all of this. And don't worry, uh, you won't be staring at my face this whole time. We will have some awesome speakers that will help us uh, get through all of this information. Those are speakers from the Union of Concerned Scientists, Citizens Climate Lobby, and also the National Wildlife Federation, to name a few. We also, of course, will be briefed by our experts that we have on FCNL staff. So after we've learned all of that, uh, we really will be focusing then on developing our advocacy skills and making sure that we know how to lobby effectively. So what, uh, how can we take that information and turn it into action? Um, and we'll go over everything that you need to know in order to prepare for a lobby visit. Um, so that happens at 5 p.m. Eastern time. You'll all be going to your separate breakout calls to prepare more specifically with other people from your state and there will also be an FCNL staffer there to make sure that you're fully prepared. We will go over how to get on your specific state call, video chat or whatever um, in a little bit. So don't worry, for now you are good to just hold tight and keep watching this live stream here. Um, so there's a lot on our plate for this first day, but we can't wait to give you the skills that you need to continue advocating even after this event is over. So like I said, we do have two days together. Um, we just went over today and then tomorrow, Monday, March 30th, we'll come back together here on this same page at 12 p.m. Eastern uh, to hear from not only a panel of congressional staffers, but also, drum roll please, I know we were really excited about this, a member of Congress, Representative Panetta, a champion for carbon pricing will also be addressing all of us. So definitely stay tuned for tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern, and that will be until 1 p.m. Eastern because then we'll transition to the bulk of tomorrow, which will be workshops dedicated to both the intersectionality of climate change with other issues and also how you can take these skills that you learn with us back home to keep advocating and making change. Whatever issue you're passionate about, we want you to be able to advocate on that issue. 
Workshops will be from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. And that, uh, again, that's tomorrow, Monday. Um, so if you want a refresher on what to expect, you can check out our website, fcnl.org SLW, and it will uh, very clearly have a schedule tab for you to look through all the details that I just mentioned. Um, okay, so we've gone over today, we've gone over tomorrow, but then comes Tuesday. So we will not be coming together via um, this virtual convening on Tuesday, but we will be lobbying all together on Tuesday. It is lobby day. This is the moment where we let members of Congress know that the issue of the climate crisis is important to us. And it must still be addressed, even though so much has been put on hold and so much has changed. Um, the climate crisis still exists and it's getting worse. And we want to tell them that it must still be addressed. Um, so you should have all heard from Justin Hurdle about your lobby visits, when they are, and also how you will be communicating with the office. If you have not gotten this email, please contact him at jhurdle at fcnl.org. Um, that's J-H-U-R-D-L-E at fcnl.org. Justin Hurdle, he's also listed on the Spring Lobby Weekend main website. You might have received an email from Bobby Trice as well. Um, they were our uh, lobby visit team. And so one of the two of them got you that information, but if you have not gotten it, reach out to Justin Hurdle and hopefully he can get you what you need. Um, so while you're lobbying on Tuesday, we really hope that you are you know, telling your stories and that you're reflecting on or remembering some of the values that we at FCNL bring to lobbying. And those values are uh, something that we'll discuss today. Now you might be sitting there thinking, okay, well, we're talking about lobbying and now you're saying values. I don't associate the two of those things together. What do you mean? Uh, we're going to explain exactly what that means. I'm going to hand it over in just a moment to Bobby again, like I've said a couple times, our program assistant for Quaker Outreach, and he's going to talk to you all about FCNL specifically as a faith-based Quaker lobbying organization. Bobby, could you go ahead and share? Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of context. The Friends Committee on National Legislation was actually founded by members of the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers, in 1943. The fundamental Quaker values of peace and justice, those are the values that Larissa was referring to, guide us in our work as we seek to affect change by speaking truth to power. When we lobby, we remember that there is that of God in every person, and we approach even the most contentious topics with a desire to have a conversation. Change happens on the Hill when we talk to all members of Congress, regardless of party, with the intention to educate them and let them know how their policies affect us. We use our voices to remind them that there are people at the end of their policy decisions, and that it is their jobs to represent us. Personally, I see worship and lobbying as parts of my spiritual practice. We hope that tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, you'll join us for Quaker, Quaker Silent Reflection on Zoom to get centered before lobbying and to share that experience with other friends. Now I'll turn it back to Larissa. Thank you so much, Bobby. So we'll definitely be going over uh, more of those values and how it is that it informs or they inform what we do um, in our not only you know policy work here on the Hill, but also our grassroots work around the country. And I wanna take this moment to talk about how our grassroots work has already helped us make progress. And what we're gonna do today, tomorrow and Tuesday is expand on that progress and just, yeah, make sure that the movement keeps moving forward. Um, thanks to advocates like you, we now have more bipartisan support than ever for legislation addressing the climate crisis. Both chambers of Congress in the last couple years have formed bipartisan climate solutions caucuses, and we have seen several bipartisan carbon pricing bills. This is the moment to act. With the right amount of groundwork and advocacy now, Congress will be ready to pass carbon pricing legislation after the 2020 elections. The task ahead of us is large. I understand that it probably feels really large, but we do have the numbers on our side. Hundreds of us that are tuning in to watch this right now 
and thousands more around the country that just need the tools and opportunities to advocate. Incremental change, change on the hill can be frustrating, I know, but I do view it this way. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about my house and the front door to my house. And let's say that at the end, or I'm sorry, the other side of that door is the solution to the climate crisis. How beautiful would that be? Um, for me right now, that door feels really far away. I could not walk there right now. Um, but every step that I take, no matter how hard it is to get me to kind of lift my foot and take that step, I do get closer to that door, to that reality that's on the other side. So I want to encourage you all to kind of lean on each other so that your frustration with the, the current situation, um, the system does not lead you to do nothing at all because that is truly when no steps will be taken towards that door. And I'm not saying that we're taking the first steps ever here either, right? We might even already be a couple steps towards that door. All of the grassroots work that we do is a step. All of the education of our peers and our friends is another step. And all of the coalition building that we do is another step. So this is an amazing opportunity to take action all over the country and get to the reality of addressing the climate crisis. And I want us to embrace it. Um, I am thrilled to begin our time together with some remarks first from an incredible speaker on why this moment in particular is so urgent for us to address the climate crisis. Um, I'm very excited to have with us Rachel Cletus who is the policy director of the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Rachel leads the program's efforts in designing and advocating for effective and equitable policies to address climate change. Rachel Cletus has over 20 years of climate policy experience at both the national and international levels. At the latest international climate negotiations this past December, she spoke on a panel in Madrid with youth climate activist Greta Thunberg, which is awesome. Rachel also has a PhD and Masters of Economics from Duke University. Rachel will be speaking to us about the magnitude of the climate crisis, how vulnerable communities are already being harmed across the world, and why federal action is so critical to addressing climate change. I think her remarks are really going to ground us for this weekend and get us started um, on the right foot in why the lobbying we are all about to do is so important now more than ever. We are definitely in capable hands right now to get us started. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's such an honor and a pleasure. Uh, I am so awed by the dedication of SCNL and, and all of you on this call today. Uh, for willing to be nimble and flexible in this moment, uh, showing up in this, uh, in this different format. I know many of us are dealing with many other things in our lives, immediate things in our lives uh, right now. And it's, it's just amazing uh, to be here with all of you today. So thank you for having me. You know, uh, our country, the whole world is in the midst of a grave public health crisis, uh, which is now being compounded by a growing economic crisis. Uh, there are over 685,000 people infected with the coronavirus worldwide right now. Over 32,000 people have died. Uh, the U.S. is now leading the world in confirmed cases. Uh, we've uh, just passed the grim mark of over 2,000 people who've died. Um, and at the same time, last uh, Thursday, the Department of Labor released numbers showing that nearly 3.3 3 million people in our country filed for unemployment last week. That's uh, an all time record and it is a really sobering reflection of where we are right now. Perhaps some of you on this call, people you know, uh, your friends, your family have been directly affected. Uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, shaken us all to the core. And I know that at a time like this, it might feel like the climate crisis uh, is more remote. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is we are facing multiple crises at the same time. We have this public health crisis, we have a growing economic crisis, and the climate crisis continues unabated in the background. 
So uh, what we are called to in this moment is of course, to make sure that immediate policies are in place to help people in distress right now. Uh, but we also have to make sure that what we're doing in the short term is also aligned with our longer term climate goals. Uh, that growing urgency, the need for swift action to cut emissions, to build climate resilience, that has not gone away. Uh, appropriately in this moment, governments and people are focused on containing the public health crisis. We need to rapidly scale up federal, state, and local actions to limit the outbreak, provide healthcare professionals with the uh, equipment, uh, the supplies that they need, ensure people have access to accurate information, healthcare, resources they need to stay safe, uh, to preserve livelihoods as far as possible and provide aid to those who are losing jobs. Uh, working people and people who live in poverty around the world right now are being really hard hit. Last week, Congress passed this $2.2 trillion recovery bill focused on immediate relief, uh, the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. It provides valuable immediate relief, but we know a lot more will need to be done, especially if this economic downturn continues in severity and duration, uh, as unfortunately is uh, expected at this point. Meanwhile, though, the changes to our climate wrought by human-caused heat-trapping emissions are continuing unabated. So what does that mean for where we are right now? Just last week, uh, we saw research from scientists that have identified a major vulnerability in the East Antarctic ice sheet that could trigger runaway feedback loops of ice loss and up to five feet of sea level rise over a long period of time. There are uncertainties around this, but what it's showing is that we are unfortunately starting to lock in the kinds of really severe irreversible uh, climate impacts that will be very, very difficult to contend with. Uh, earlier, uh, NOAA released its spring forecast showing that in many places in the Midwest and South Central US are forecasted to have another year of flooding. Following on last year's record-breaking, devastating floods uh, along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers that caused billions of dollars worth of damage, harmed livelihoods, farmers, destroyed property, uh, put a lot of people's lives in danger. So while this year the forecast isn't quite as severe everywhere, there are places that are exposed to risk. Even just this weekend, we're seeing places in Illinois being hit by heavy rainfall. Uh, UCS actually uh, released an analysis last week showing that many of the places that are projected to have high flood risk are also facing a growing risk of coronavirus infection. So can you imagine places that are contending with trying to deal with this public health crisis facing flooding? How do you evacuate people, have them safely in shelters when we're also needing to physically distance uh, from each other? How do emergency first responders cope with all of the uh, things that they're going to have to do to deal with a flood crisis when they already are over uh, uh, absolutely overextended uh, dealing with this current public health crisis. So unfortunately, the wildfire season, the hurricane season, uh, extreme heat are not going to stop just because we have this public health crisis. And we're going to have to understand and prepare for the fact that we will have these multiple layers of cascading risk. Uh, and we're going to have to find ways to prepare ahead of time. Um, so for example, our analysis is showing that places in Iowa, South Dakota, Louisiana, that are being really hard hit uh, by the coronavirus uh, and are projected to get worse infections as we go forward are also going to be at risk from flooding. What also hasn't changed is the underlying science. Uh, and we know that the science and scientists are bringing ever more urgent uh, news to us, whether it's the IPCC 1.5C report or the fourth national climate assessment, both of which were released in 2018, showing that climate change is already here and now. It's already affecting people, uh, daily lives, ecosystems uh, right now. And if we fail to cut our emissions sharply, it's only going to get worse. What I will say also is that we are learning a lot of hard lessons right now as we tackle this coronavirus crisis, that if we stop to take heed of these lessons, they can serve us well in our fight to fight the, clim the longer term climate fight we're in too. Most importantly, what we're le learning is the need to center science, equity, and justice 
in how we understand these problems in the first case and how we frame our solutions. So let's start with some really basic things. Listen to the scientists and experts. Facts should not be political or partisan. When we sideline science, when we deliberately spread misinformation, it harms people and it reduces the effectiveness of our response. It's vital to get out ahead and prepare before an acute crisis hits. And we're seeing how painful it is when we're underprepared and desperately trying to play catch up. This is true both for this current crisis as well as climate change. We're learning that those who get hit hardest are often marginalized or otherwise vulnerable populations, the elderly, those who live in poverty, those with pre-existing health conditions, those who have the least workplace protections or benefits, communities of color, undocumented people, migrant laborers, those living in refugee camps, the homeless, the incarcerated. Uh, these are the people who are being hit now. They are the people on the front lines of climate risk too. Those who are on the front lines of this crisis, they have a unique understanding of how it affects them and they must have a seat at the table as we formulate solutions. We're also learning we need federal action. Yes, state and local authorities can and are doing a lot but there is no substitute for the power and the resources that can only be deployed and summoned by the federal government. We need to work with nations across the world and that's the only way you solve global crises. We have to do our part in our communities, but everybody in the world has to pull in the same direction. And we have to step up to help countries that have fewer resources to cope. Above all, what we're learning right now is about the resilience of the human spirit that even in these desperate times, we're seeing ordinary people rise to the challenge in extraordinary ways. Um, and those are the people that we need to hold up to the light right now and whose example we need to follow. So with the climate crisis, we know what the solutions are. We've known them for a long time. What's lacking is political will. And that's why the work that all of you are doing today and that you're set out to do over the next days and months ahead, that's critical. You are building power all across the country. You're bringing diverse voices to the table. You're putting pressure on policymakers in Washington, and you're making sure that climate change is centered in people's lives. This is about improving people's lives, and it is not a partisan issue. This should be a bipartisan issue. There is no reason why this should get politicized. What we need to tackle the climate crisis is a sustained and just equitable transition to a clean energy economy. If we do this right, we won't just curtail carbon emissions, we'll build the kind of economy, the kind of society that benefits everyone, not just the select few. It's not just a techno transition, although we do have to make technology transitions. This is about deep socioeconomic changes. This is about shifting power to places where power has not been. Uh, we know that the U.S. has to get to net zero emissions by no later than 2050 to contribute to global efforts to limit climate change. And we should aim to halve our emissions by 2030 to get firmly on that path. The U.S. can and must do that. We have to ramp up investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, electrify as many energy end uses as possible, for example, in the transportation sector. We have to store more carbon in our soils and forests and vegetation. All communities should have access to uh, clean, affordable energy. Many low-income communities and communities of color bear a disproportionate burden of our pollution from fossil fuels. Uh, they need to be first in line to get access to this clean, renewable energy. Our climate solutions must deliver reductions in the cumulative burden of pollutants, not just carbon, but other air and water and soil pollutants in environmental justice communities. We've got to invest in a just transition for coal miners and coal dependent communities who are being hard hit as we transition away from coal. You know, let's make the investments right now uh, in low carbon climate resilient uh, infrastructure and measures that will help us in this moment as we rebuild our economy, but will also help us in the longer term as we tackle the climate uh, challenge. In the months to come, Congress is going to legislate on economic recovery and stimulus packages. Let's make sure that those packages contain the solutions we need. Let's make the kinds of investments in the power, transportation, and industrial sectors that put us in a path to a low carbon economy. Let's invest in climate resilience that helps safeguard people, property, and livelihoods. 
let's make sure that marginalized and economically disadvantaged communities have a seat at the table and are part of this vision of this thriving economy that uh, uh, benefits all. We need family sustaining wages, affordable access to housing, healthcare, nutrition. Clean energy investments make sense in any market. We've seen the market drive a historic transition away from coal to cheaper forms of energy. But right now in this moment, an influx of public and private capital to productive job generating sectors like building clean climate uh, resilient infrastructure can play a vital role in jumpstarting the economy and putting us on a more sustainable path. Yet we're seeing fossil fuel companies and their political allies opportunistically use this moment to try to expand support for fossil fuels and lock in fossil fuel dependence. We see coal companies trying to use bankruptcy to walk away from pay and pension and medical benefits that they owe their workers. Those who seek in this moment to advance their narrow profit interests over societal good, they need to be exposed and held accountable. We need Congress to act uh, on climate solutions, on solutions that benefit our economy and improve people's well-being. In the long term, it's the failure to address climate change that poses the biggest threat to our prosperity and well-being. Ours today, but more importantly, our children and grandchildren. Uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to me today. I look forward to engaging with you in dialogue. What I want to tell you at the end is that this is a long fight. Be kind to yourself, be safe, take care of your health, uh, especially your mental health. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we're going to be in this for years and decades to come. Uh, so really the work that you are doing and the spirit in which you're doing it is going to be what sustains us in this long fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I have some questions. Well, I have people that have questions for you. Sure. So first we're gonna hear from Itzel Perez Hernandez from New Jersey. Itzel, are you there? Yes, hi. Hi, um, thank you so much for everything that you just mentioned. Uh, my question is, what is the most challenging aspect of international climate change negotiation? Yeah, I would say to date, uh, one of the biggest challenges has been that nations have been engaging as if it's a zero sum game, uh, as is often the case in global geopolitics. And climate change is one of those challenges that really requires us to work together, to call on that spirit of global cooperation. Uh, we're all in this together and we're not going to win this fight unless we win it with equity centered, with everybody pulling in the same direction. Um, so I think uh, and I hope that as it becomes clear that we're all being affected, that uh, the impulse to act on our better nature and actually work together is what is going to triumph versus the narrow self-interest. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have... Autumn Yates from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, who also has a question for you. Hi, so you've been doing work around climate change for more than a decade. Um, what progress have you seen made over time in regard to states and nations taking responsibility for mitigating the effects of climate change? You know, I'll tell you the most encouraging thing for me is to uh, watch the fact that as uh, the costs of renewables have fallen so dramatically, we've seen nations around the world uh, embrace renewable energy first. Uh, wherever you are in the world right now, uh, there are success stories about how uh, the transition away from fossil fuels to renewables is underway. Not fast enough for sure, uh, but it's definitely underway and now we need to double down on that progress. The other thing that I've found very encouraging is that people have understood that climate change is not separate. It's not just a quote unquote environmental issue. It's deeply embedded in uh, people's quality of life. So whether you work on healthcare or nutrition uh, or women's rights or, or children's uh, education, children's welfare, all of these issues are intertwined with climate. And the opportunity here for win-win solutions is huge. And we're seeing countries start to embrace that perspective that yes, economic development and well-being can go hand in hand with climate action. Thank you again, Rachel. And we have one more question and this is gonna come from Bobby. Well, Bobby will give us the question from YouTube. Bobby, are you still there? Great. Yeah, 
I'm here. We're getting a few questions on YouTube, and here's our first one. Uh, Eric from Wilmington College, Ohio asks, with the rapid spread of coronavirus as a result of globalization, how can we explain the severe climate emergency in the same way? Well, I, I think the uh, what we need to do in this moment, of course, is be responsive to the crisis that is right before people right now, which is the public health crisis and this growing economic challenge that's emerging from it. But at the same time, I think what we have to recognize is that we are unfortunately going to see worsening climate impacts. Even this year, you know, we will see a uh, fire season. We will see intensified storms. Uh, there is a, a huge crisis in the Horn of Africa that's unfolding right now around a locust infestation that is of epic proportions and that has connections with severe uh, rainfall events that happened over the last year, year and a half in that region. So, and that's threatening the food security in the Horn of Africa right now. So I, I, I think that uh, the way that these things are connected is they're about people's lives. They're about people's well-being. This is nothing uh, more uh, you know, abstract than that. This is really about people's lives. So finding solutions, finding ways to talk about these issues in a way that connects directly with people's challenges right now is the way uh, to, I think, better solutions that are aligned across all of these crises. Thank you so much for being here. So that's all the time we have for questions. But um, again, taking the time to get us started on this uh, just huge undertaking. Thank you so much for being with us, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And good luck with your lobby days. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Bye. All right, so at this point, we are going to take, I feel like I'm on TV, a 30 second commercial break, but stick around because we'll be right back. <laughs> And welcome back. I am now happy to introduce the team of experts that we have on FCNL staff, my colleagues, Emily Warsba, who leads our climate action lobby team, and Alicia Cannon, otherwise known as Leash, the program assistant working on this issue. Thank you both for being here. And it sounds like we're going to get a lot more information about carbon pricing. Hi, my name is Emily Wurzba, and I'm the Legislative Manager for Sustainable Energy and Environment at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. So I lead FCNL's lobbying work on climate change. Hi, my name is Alicia Cannon, and I'm the Program Assistant for Sustainable Energy and Environment at FCNL, and we are so excited that you guys are going to be lobbying with us tomorrow and Tuesday, mostly Tuesday. So how this is going to go, I'm going to ask Emily some questions about the urgency of climate change and about the lobby ask. So, Emily, we just heard from Rachel that we are in a climate emergency. So why is federal congressional action so important right now, especially in the midst of a global health crisis? Right. So we are living in truly unprecedented times. Um, our country and entire world is dealing with a crisis unlike any that we've ever experienced before. So it is vital that Congress focus on addressing this immediate threat, working to save lives and invent jobs and protect our economy, especially those most vulnerable. Um, but beyond this immediate threat that we're facing, COVID-19 is also a message from the future about how a danger to one country can be a danger to the entire world. Um, and climate change is another one of those dangers. So right now we need everyone to be staying at home, we need our leaders to be working to address this immediate health crisis and to make these appropriate investments in the economy and around job creation. But we also have to keep talking about the next big challenge that will face us as a global community um, before these challenges overwhelm us, which is why we are here this week um, to urge Congress to take a first step in uh, addressing the climate crisis by supporting legislation that will put a price on carbon. If we can build support for this legislation this year, 
That will determine what Congress is capable of doing in 2021. Climate change is another crisis that is harming people all over the world already, primarily low-income communities and communities of color. Our world needs to drastically reduce emissions in order to stave off the worst consequences of climate change. As Rachel said, there's really important work being done at the local and state level to address climate change, but ultimately, we need robust federal action in order to be a global leader for the international community. And we've seen how changes in administration can drastically shift environmental regulations designed to reduce those emissions. So ultimately, we need Congress to pass ambitious and equitable legislation at the federal level to help keep global temperatures from rising more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. You make us sound really important. We're laying the groundwork. Uh, so tell me more about carbon pricing. Why is it good? Why does it work? Yeah, so carbon pricing is a market-based solution, um, approach, is a market-based approach to reducing our country's greenhouse gas emissions by placing a price on those emissions. Many economists agree that pricing emissions is the most cost-effective lever to actually reduce emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary. In fact, every living former federal chair of the Federal Reserve and 27 Nobel Prize winning economists all support putting a price on carbon. So here's how it works. A price is set per metric ton of greenhouse gas emissions. Say for example, $15 per ton emitted by a fossil fuel producer. So this could be oil as it's being refined, coal coming out of the mine or natural gas when it's being processed. And then each year, the price on those emissions increases. This will drive down emissions and actually incentivize a shift towards a clean energy economy because it will be more expensive to use fossil fuels and it will make clean energy sources cheaper. I had never heard of carbon pricing before coming to FCNL. And when I first learned about it, I remember thinking it's so wonky, this is confusing, but now I know it's a great tool to address the climate crisis. Can you explain to everyone what we look for in a carbon price? Yeah, so a good carbon pricing bill will set goals for how much our emissions should be reduced each year. Those emission targets should be set in line with the scientific community's recommendations in order to avoid the catastrophic impacts of climate change. And then each year, the EPA or another agency should be measuring how effective the tax is actually working. We want to make sure that the carbon price will get us to our final emissions reductions goals, because if emissions are not going down quickly enough, the price needs to increase. Um, this kind of policy will generate a ton of revenue that can be used to help make the transition easier for vulnerable communities, can be used to invest in clean energy and climate resilient infrastructure, or it can be used to offset other taxes. And we think that carbon pricing legislation is one of the first solutions that Congress can actually pass in 2021 as part of a broader suite of policy ideas to decarbonize our entire economy and get to net zero emissions by 2050. And carbon pricing already has bipartisan support in Congress. There are currently seven carbon pricing bills in Congress, four of which have bipartisan support. All of that is so great. Bipartisan support is crucial for making sure that legislation outlasts administration changes. Personally, because I'm type A, I love that there are interim goals so that we actually like hit our net zero goal of 2050. Um, it's really important and make sure that the tax is effective. I want to point out that FCNL has a really unique perspective as a faith-based institution. Can you explain what FCNL's perspective brings to a carbon tax? That's a great question. So one of FCNL's biggest concerns is how a carbon price might affect a number of vulnerable communities, including communities of color, rural communities, tribal nations and indigenous communities, immigrant communities, those who are disabled or are living with chronic health conditions, um, those not living in the wage economy, and those living in poverty. So any carbon pricing mechanism cannot be fiscally regressive. Uh, not only are many of these communities disproportionately impacted by climate impacts, they are often least responsible for causing the problem of climate change in the first place. And these communities could potentially be harmed by carbon pricing if the legislation isn't designed in a way to ensure that revenue from the tax is helping to offset increased costs in heating your home or increased costs at the gas pump. Um, so FCNL has a list of our carbon pricing principles online which we use to evaluate any carbon pricing legislation. Uh, you can find those principles and read them yourself if you 
go to fcnl.org slash SLW and click on the resources tab. All right, so I think we're all beginning to understand carbon pricing more generally. And here's a quick overview. We want to make it more expensive to pollute. We want to incentivize a shift to a clean energy economy. We want to make sure that vulnerable communities are helped and not harmed by a carbon tax. Now, I'm sure we all are very excited to learn about the bill we're lobbying on tomorrow and Tuesday. Emily, take it away. Yes, I am thrilled that we will be lobbying to add more co-sponsors to the Climate Action Rebate Act, which is in both the House and the Senate. The bill places a very strong price on carbon emissions. It's $15 per metric ton of greenhouse gas emissions and increases by $15 each year. And if those emissions reductions goals that have been laid out aren't being met, the price will actually increase by $30 every year instead. Uh, the Climate Action Rebate Act is designed to reduce U.S. carbon emissions by 55% by 2030 um, and seeks to achieve 100% reduction by 2050, below 2017 levels. It is designed to send a critical price signal to help prevent global temperatures from rising more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is in line with what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recommends and echoes those same goals that Rachel mentioned in her speech earlier. Revenue from the bill is used for a variety of purposes. 70% of the money generated by the tax is actually distributed back to low income and middle income families in the form of a monthly dividend. 20% of the revenue goes towards funding a number of different climate infrastructure projects. 5% um, of the revenue funds clean energy research and development and the remaining 5% helps with transition assistance for fossil fuel workers and those disproportionately affected by high energy costs. There's also a border tax adjustment, which basically means that imports coming from a country without a comparable carbon price would get taxed and American exports going out would receive a credit. And this would just help ensure that US goods are still cost competitive. So this is a really strong carbon tax, which is great. We wanna reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and net zero by 2050 is incredible. But how is this bill um, helping vulnerable communities specifically? Great question. Um, one of the reasons that I'm most excited about this bill um, is that it uses its revenue to help a number of vulnerable communities. I'm not gonna have time to name every single program this bill funds. So if you're really interested, um, I encourage you to read the full bill text online. Um, but here are just a few examples of some of the programs that the bill would fund. Inner city passenger rail, coastal resiliency, hospital and health center climate resiliency, clean drinking water, cleaning up Superfund sites, which are to highly toxic waste sites often located in communities of color. It'll help fund reforestation. It'll fund rural broadband access weatherization assistance for low-income communities and financial assistance for low-income households to pay their energy bills, rural flood prevention, the Green Climate Fund, which is an international program that helps low-income countries adapt to the worst effects of climate change, and then transition assistance for fossil fuel dependent workers, which will include things like wage insurance, pension and health benefits, early retirement, and job retraining. And these are only some of the many programs that this bill funds all designed to ensure that vulnerable communities will be protected. Of course, it's really important to say that FCNL believes that carbon pricing is only one piece of the solution that's ultimately going to be necessary to address the climate crisis. And we know that many more bills need to be passed in order to fully protect communities of color and other vulnerable communities, and to ensure that our economy can fully decarbonize. Wow. You listed so many provisions, and I know that you didn't list all of them. Um, it's incredible, and like Emily said, of course we know that a carbon price is not the end-all, be-all of climate legislation. There's going to have to be a lot of other complementary policies passed in order to fully address the climate crisis. And this can seem really overwhelming. Like, climate anxiety is a real thing, folks. So remind me, remind us all, why now? Why is this so important in our advocacy? In the past few months, we have witnessed unprecedented public climate action, from the wildly successful youth climate strikes to youth leader Greta Thunberg fearlessly admonishing world leaders. Um, the public will for action is truly there. However, we also know that 2021 is the earliest possible window 
where we will actually be able to pass meaningful climate legislation in Congress. But even then, even in 2021, we will most likely face a divided Congress. Bipartisan support for any action is absolutely essential. Therefore, we believe that what we do in 2020 right now is a critical time for action because what we do now will determine what's possible for next year. So right now, 2020 is the time to build relationships with our elected officials and educate them on why carbon pricing is the most cost efficient way to reduce our emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary. While we are supporting a number of carbon pricing bills currently in Congress, we believe that now is the time to lift up our carbon pricing principles and urge Congress to support what we believe most closely matches those principles, the Climate Action Rebate Act. Our meetings with legislators these next few days will ensure that this solution can pass at the next possible chance we have to advance federal climate policy. So thank you for your advocacy. I'm so thrilled that you will be meeting with your representatives on this critical topic with everything going on in the world right now, especially we value your commitment to addressing the climate crisis and to protecting vulnerable communities. Thank you. Thank you so much to Emily and Leash for taking us through, um, yeah, what we're doing here exactly and the legislation specifically that we'll be working on. So we do have more questions for you both. The first question is coming from Hannah Sievers, who is joining us from, uh, well, she goes to Houghton College. So Hannah, are you there? Yes. I'm right here. Hi, Hannah from Houghton. Hi. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering, you touched on this a little bit, but can you say more specifically how this legislation helps keep businesses and corporations accountable so that they keep their businesses in the US and not move it to, the, to other countries? Thank you for that question. That's a really important question. We definitely want to make sure that um, corporations are held accountable. So um, the bill has a provision called the border tax adjustment, which basically is designed specifically to prevent corporations from going overseas instead. It's designed to prevent leakage, which is one of our um, FCNL principles on carbon pricing. So what, what this provision does is it, it means that if, if a corporation decided to, to move abroad, um, their goods would be still charged a fee every time they tried to um, get something imported into the United States. And so it really doesn't make sense for them to move overseas where there's less stringent um, climate change policy in place because they'll still be paying that, that price just through a different means. So thank you so much for that question. That's very important. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you again, Emily. I think we're now going to go to uh, Bobby, who is going to give us a question from uh, YouTube. Did I get that right, Bobby? <laughs> That's right. OK, uh, good. <laughs> we, we've gotten a few agriculture-related questions, so I'm going to give you an example here. Uh, Lauren asks, how will carbon pricing affect agriculture? Many farmers run carbon-emitting equipment and cannot afford the newer, greener equipment. Will there be exceptions made to feed the world? Great questions. Um, so I think there are a number of ways you can answer that. I think one, um, this bill in particular um, comes with a portion of the revenue going towards a dividend, which will help kind of offset some of those immediate costs. A portion of the revenue from this bill actually will also be invested in regenerative agriculture um, techniques designed to help farmers maybe with a pilot program to sequester more carbon in the soil or to help incentivize farmers to do the amazing work that they're already doing in conserving our land and trying to preserve it for, for future generations. Um, I think this is a really good example of a place where we're going to need complementary policies in order to help fully make those transition. I think commonly we hear frequently that the agriculture sector, our transportation sector, our manufacturing industry, all of these sectors are a little bit harder to fully decarbonize and are gonna need kind of some deeper policies put in place um, because we wanna make sure that um, businesses are still being protected and farmers are still being protected while also ensuring that we're reducing our emissions. So thank you for that question. Um, it's really important. And we're gonna have a whole workshop tomorrow that will delve more deeply into this topic. So I really encourage you all to tune in if you're interested in diving more. Thank you both. And now we have Chelsea Adams, who is a uh, former member of our Advocacy Corps and I believe is calling from Georgia. Yes. Hi, Chelsea. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? 
I'm doing good. I just have a really quick question. Do you know if there have been other countries or states who have already tried to do carbon pricing? And if they have, how effective has that been? Great question. Uh, Yes, so that's the exciting thing. Um, There are other countries that are already working on this type of policy. Um, There, Canada actually, our our neighbor to the north has um, carbon pricing in place where individual provinces um, have different levels of carbon pricing they're enacting. The European Union also um, has a price on carbon um, and are are working on um, implementing it. I think it's been really exciting to see um, where the rest of the world is. And I think it points to another uh, reason why the US should should join in and, and join the global community in this effort. So thank you for that question. And it looks like we have time for one more question. And so we're gonna go to Annie who has a question from YouTube. Yes, I'm here in YouTube headquarters, also known as my apartment. Um, or sorry, Facebook headquarters, what am I saying? Uh, I forgot where I was. So I have Kat North up here, she's from Montana. And she wants to know, how do we address carbon pricing in the private sector, like plastic production? Great question. So um, the price on emissions under this bill is enacted upstream, which means that it's kind of collected at the earliest point possible. So like I mentioned earlier, coal coming from the mine or natural gases is being processed. So those prices will get passed along to a number of industries um, that either uses kind of carbon intensive materials or energy in the production of their products. And so we're assuming that um, the fossil fuel producers will will pass along that price. And so that's why um, the bill's revenue is used to help kind of offset that price for the consumer because the consumer, not only will they be getting money back and seeing incentives and clean energy, they'll be able to choose how they spend that money themselves. And so they'll, we're hoping that they'll choose to invest in cleaner products, um, cleaner energy sources. And so, um, so private sector businesses, they'll still be paying that price. It'll just be kind of indirectly through the fossil fuel sector. But thank you for that question. Thank you. You will be hearing from Emily and Leash more about the legislation uh, later. Um, And so if you have any questions that were not answered, you will get more opportunity. And I will definitely make sure that you all know when that opportunity comes. But for now, we are going to kind of shift gears and talk about how it is that this work we're about to do fits into the broader movement to address the climate emergency. And so in just a moment, we will be uh, having a speaker join us from Citizens Climate Lobby, Jamie DeMarco. But um, before we do that, we are going to take another 30 second break just to kind of stretch, get some water. I might get some coffee. So we'll be right back. Thank you all so much. Okay, hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, Now I am very excited to introduce our next guest, Jamie DeMarco. Jamie DeMarco is the state level carbon pricing coordinator for the Citizens Climate Lobby. He is dedicated to passing state level legislation that will serve as a model and hopefully inspiration for national lawmakers. Not to mention he is also a former FCNL Young Fellow. So welcome back, Jamie. Uh, Jamie has held just about every position in the broader climate movement that you can think of, which is why I am so glad that he is here to share his perspective about how congressional action fits in the broader climate change movement. Let's welcome Jamie DeMarco. Thank you for being here, Jamie. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I really got my first taste of advocacy at a Spring Lobby weekend years ago, and so it's really an honor to be here and speaking. Um, I work on this because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has told us that we have nine years and eight months to make an unprecedented transformation of nearly every aspect of our society. And if we don't, millions of people will die. 
Knowing that makes me want to do the most I possibly can to stop the climate crisis. But what does that look like? If you wanted to do the most you possibly could, what would you do? Bill Moyer has a theory that when people contribute to a movement, they tend to fill one of four roles, the rebel, the organizer, the advocate, or the helper. Um, the rebel creates commotion and forces people in power to make a change. The organizer um, collects people who may not even know each other and turns them into a well-oiled machine. The advocate speaks directly uh, with people in power like lawmakers um, and the helper goes to those affected by the situation and helps on the ground. That is a picture of me being a rebel. You can see me in there somewhere protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. Because to change everything, we need everyone, which means that all four of those roles I listed, um, we need all four of them working on this. And when I first asked myself, what does it look like for me to do the most I can on the climate crisis? My answer looked a lot like what you see on the screen. Um, I just thought that if I tied my body to things that were allowing the process to happen, then I'd be doing the most I could do. I got arrested opposing uh, the Keystone XL pipeline, as you can see. The police had to come out, cut our zip ties and bus us away, but we stopped that pipeline. Um, and after that, I got arrested protesting fracking in my home state of Maryland. And the very next day after our action, the Republican governor announced his support for a fracking ban. And as an immediate result, we passed a law in Maryland banning fracking forever. And that's when I thought to myself, I have found the answer. I am doing the most I can to stop the climate crisis. But then I was doing my community service with my cellmate from the fracking ban action. And he was married to someone who had been working on that campaign for like three years. And he said, you know, I joke with my wife. I say, you know, I don't see what was so hard about banning fracking. It only took me one day to get the job done. Uh, and I laughed at the joke, but inside I thought, wow, that's really kind of how I was thinking. I realized in that moment that the press covered arrests are the tip of the iceberg of change making. And I wanted to see what was beneath the surface. So I put down the rebels zip ties and I picked up the organizer's clipboard. I became a community organizer for the Maryland Clean Energy Jobs Campaign to expand renewables and invest in clean energy businesses owned by women and people of color. I went to hundreds and hundreds of community meetings, um, churches and small businesses and helped build a coalition of over 650 organizations all over the state that supported this bill. Taken individually, no one of those organizations had the power to tell lawmakers what to do, but taken together, they did. And that's when I said, I have found the answer. I am doing the most I can to stop the climate crisis. But then the time came to actually get the bill passed in the legislature. And I wanted to see how the sausage get me, got made. So I put down the organizer's clipboard and I put on the advocate's suit. I went to Annapolis, the capital of Maryland, every day of the legislative session and spoke directly with lawmakers about the need to pass the bill. I learned that even an impressive list of organizations cannot speak for itself. Um, and sometimes nothing convinces a lawmaker better than a compelling in-person conversation. They are, after all, humans. And that campaign succeeded. We passed the Clean Energy Jobs Act. And that's when I said, I have found the answer. I am doing the most I can to solve the climate crisis. But then my housemate Sage quit her job and traveled to the panhandle of Florida after a hurricane, volunteering to rebuild houses. I had worked to pass legislation and stop fossil fuel projects and all of that reduced emissions. But what if all those emission reductions got drowned out in global trends of CO2 emissions and none of what I had done actually made a difference in the amount of suffering climate change would cause? Sage had actually picked up the helper's shovel and was helping people right now. And that's when I thought to myself, Sage has found the answer. She is doing the most to solve the climate crisis. Um, I tell this story with its various epiphanies to emphasize that there is no one thing that you can do to be the most effective at stopping climate change. Trying to decide which of the movement's roles is most important is like asking someone, what's more important? your heart, your lungs, or your skin? The obvious answer is you need all of them. And similarly, a movement needs all of its roles. Uh, we are called to different kinds of change making at different times, but tomorrow you will be advocates speaking directly with lawmakers. The day after that, 
Who knows what you will be? I was muted. Thank you so much, Jamie, for uh, sharing your experience with us and uh, telling us all of those stories. So we do have a couple questions for you. Um, first, we have Emily Keller from Mount Union College in Ohio. Hello. Um, my question is, as young adults, I feel as though we are not respected as much or truly listened to by those in power. So how can we individually make our voices heard over those voices coming from the opposing side of which are older with seemingly more experience and knowledge? That is a really good question. Um, and it's not easy. I mean, I think in some respects, the only answer is elbow grease, like just wait, just like there's no way to get a stain out of a dish you're washing without like putting a lot of effort into it, there's no way to make your voice more powerful than the voices of those with entrenched power than to put a lot of work into it. Showing up one time and having one conversation isn't going to transform the world. It only, we can only affect lasting positive change if we show up day after day. And so I think that um, to, to overcome that entrenched power, we just need to keep at it and not give up. But great question. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Emily, for asking that question. It looks like we have a question from YouTube. Bobby, take it away. Absolutely. Uh, Chloe Mason asks, Jamie, in a time of turbulence, how can we be rebels in a Quakerly way? In a time of turbulence, how can be, we be Quakers in a, uh, rebels in a Quakerly way? That's a good question. Obviously, uh, with COVID-19, everything has to be rethought. It's a lot harder to, to take to the streets. There are a lot of strikes planned for Earth Day that now have to be called off. Um, and we're living in an unprecedented time. So I'm not sure how to give advice about how to be a rebel um, in COVID-19 because no one's lived through this before. And I would just say that I think in, as I see people adapting to what it looks like to organize and make change when you have to be virtual, um, young people have been the most successful at innovating and finding the ways to do that. And so I, if I were you, I wouldn't look around for someone who knows how to do this because literally no one has ever done this, but I trust that you are gonna find the answers. Thank you. And let's go now to Facebook headquarters. Annie, it looks like you have a question. Yep, back here at Facebook headquarters. <laughs> uh, Tora from Virginia wants to know, what's the best part about being a climate change advocate? And what advice would you have for young folks who are passionate about the issue? Um, I think the best part about being a climate change advocate, I'm not sure if you mean like at like working on climate change or filling the advocate role. Um, I think filling the advocate role is, is what Toro is getting at. Okay. I mean, the best part about being an advocate is that it's all about relationships. Like your job is relationships. I mean, the companies that have, that try to have strangleholds on our federal government spend hundreds of millions of dollars on lobbyists. And lobbyists, their only asset is their relationship. They're just friends with lawmakers. Um, and if you can develop genuine friendships with people in power, then you have real power. And so um, one of, I mean, there's a ups and downs to every role, but I think one of the greatest benefits of being an advocate is that your job when you wake up every day is to make more better friendships with other people in the world. Um, and I think that brings a lot of joy. I love that, Jamie, thank you. And I think that that's a great way um, to say, thank you for being here one more time and sharing. I think now we definitely have a better understanding of why lobbying matters. The roles that you went through, um, that definitely taught me a lot. So um, thank you again. And we are uh, running a little bit early actually, which is very awesome. Wow, I think. who so does we, we that? Have Congratulations. Some, we have some time actually for more questions. I think Emily was, going over a lot of details related to carbon pricing and the legislation we'll be working on. And it looked like there were a lot of questions coming through. So we will actually have a moment now to answer one or two. So surprise, Emily, we're gonna ask you to come back and answer one or two more questions before we move on to kind of the bulk of how we lobby and getting you ready for that. So let's go to, I don't know who wants to go first, Annie or Bobby. Um, let's go to Bobby. Okay, Bobby from YouTube, what other questions do we have for Emily? Absolutely, we have a question from Jones, an Advocacy Corps member in Alabama. 
He asks, the current admin has shown how EPA appointments can impact the strength of the agency. How would that impact the efficacy of carbon pricing? That is such an important question. Thank you for asking. Yeah, so it's been truly astounding to see how many environmental regulations have been rolled back. Um, regulations like limiting mercury that is toxic to babies and um, basic car efficiency standards. I mean, it's truly astounding. And so um, for us, this just points to the importance of why federal action um, legislation being passed by Congress is so important because if you're solely relying on the EPA or a particular administration to um, use their regulatory authority to solve the climate crisis, there's no long-term durability or stability in what those policies can mean because you could just elect a new president and four years later, we're on a completely different path. And so um, the really cool thing about the Climate Action Rebate Act is that those emissions reduction goals are set by law. They're set by Congress, um, not the EPA. The EPA does have a role to play in kind of implementing the bill. Their job is to, um, for transparency's sake, make sure that they're evaluating and monitoring emissions reductions, making sure that um, our emissions are actually being reduced at the scale needed. Um, so I think you, have, you would have congressional oversight there to make sure that the EPA is actually appropriately reporting to Congress what our levels of emissions are. And, and the nice thing about that is that um, those levels can be independently verified by other scientists too. So there's kind of that additional check. So um, we think, again, to reiterate, the EPA has such important tools that need to be used to their max, but we also really need to make sure um, that Congress is taking action um, because that will be durable kind of as administrations change. So thank you for that question. Uh, really, really important. And now let's go over to Annie who has a question from Facebook. Oh, sorry about that. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question here from Nick Bevins. He says, my state, New Mexico, is the third largest oil producer in the nation. Our legislators are frankly addicted to the revenue, refusing to pass bills like fracking moratorium. How do we break into fossil fuels addiction um, at the state level? Yep, that's a really important question as well. Um, a number of states have very different energy mixes. Um, some states are way more fossil fuel dependent um, than other places that are luckily able to rely more on clean energy sources. Um, and so I think one of the really important things that can be done is that states begin to diversify their energy portfolios. So um, trying to introduce more solar energy, more wind power, um, there's a number of renewable sources out there. And I think for states that can help diversify their energy mix, do more energy efficiency measures. Um, that, that's one way. And I think um, there are really great um, statistics that you can pull in talking about the, the number of clean energy jobs in a state that can be produced and a, and a way to kind of reframe the conversation about what's possible for a state as they're going to um, transform to a cleaner energy economy. Um, and I think it is really important to acknowledge that um, for states that have a heavier reliance on fossil fuels, that means their transition is going to be a little bit more difficult. And we don't want to kind of gloss over that fact. I think we have to be very real with people about um, the loss that could come from that. And that's why it's so important that we're um, supporting bills like the Climate Action Rebate Act, which actually really dedicate a portion of the revenue to help with transition assistance for workers in the fossil fuel industry or um, help to invest in communities that have been historically more heavily dependent on the fossil fuel industry. So really important question that we could have such a long conversation about that topic, um, but really uh, thank you for the question. And I think we have another question now from uh, YouTube again. Bobby? Yeah, we do. Um, Mike asks a more general question about uh, building relationships in your advocacy. How do you work on a relationship when lobbying or in lobbying when the congressperson or staff person pushes back and is rude and not at all sympathetic to our position? Yes, great question. Um, so a couple of things to remember. One, when you're talking with a congressional staffer, um, when you're a constituent, it's their job to be nice to you. Um, they represent you. Uh, they really have to listen to you, even if they disagree with your policy position. Um, it's pretty rare that you're going to have a meeting with a congressional staffer that is directly rude or confrontational to you. Um, but my advice, if that does happen, uh, is to really bring it back to your own personal story. 
um, it's really easy for people to dismiss a fact if they have their own fact they're bringing to the table um, or to dismiss whatever scientific statistic you're bringing. But if you're there talking about how climate change is already impacting your community, um, if you're there talking about the changes that you've personally seen or experienced, or maybe a loved one or a friend somewhere else around the country, um, because we know not everyone has lived, thankfully, through a catastrophic climate disaster, right? But, but we all have reasons why we care. And so when you're, when you're leading from, from the heart, from our moral obligation to take action, that's the moment where you can connect with them at a personal level. And at the very least, they have to listen um, to what you're having to say. And then I would say, you know, if, if you had a really terrible experience for some reason, there are always other people who work for that member of Congress, right? So you can always, um, maybe you were talking with the environmental staffer, you can always go talk with the legislative director instead, or you can always go meet with their in-district representative, maybe in your hometown rather than DC. So I think don't give up um, just because you have one bad experience, but thank you for that question. All righty. Um, so at this point, thank you again, Emily, for letting us kind of uh, jump you back in there for some more questions. I actually want to remind everyone that's watching right now, in case you hopped on just recently or um, even just like half an hour after we got started, I did mention that we really want to capture just how many people are watching, are learning, and are going to take action with us. I encouraged everyone earlier today to take a selfie, whether it be um, literally by yourself or with the group that you might be watching this with or the friend that you're watching this with and send it to us at Quaker Lobby at gmail.com. I already got a couple that I saw. Um, Thank you so much for sending those. And also, um, you know, if you're interested or if you want to share, which we really hope that you will, your experience with your friends on social media, make sure that you're tagging FCNL on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and let us know that you're here. Uh, some groups that I mentioned earlier, uh, I forgot some, as I said, because there are a lot of you, which is great. And I want to go ahead and just continue to shout out some people that I know are watching. We have people from Dallas, Texas, specifically the Dallas Peace and Justice Center. Hi. We have someone um, who got a group together in Florida. We have a couple people from Florida, I think, um, from all over the state. I know that we have an organizer and a group in Mississippi. We have some organizers in Alabama, um, specifically Samford University, I know will um, uh, we have an organizer there. Annie, Bobby, are there any people that were kind of shouting themselves out earlier that we just didn't get to hear from? Maybe you all can jump in with some other people that we have. Yeah, absolutely. I have a lot of folks here on Facebook who said hello early on. Um, we have Emma from Boston from Earlham College, and she also does Quaker Voluntary Service, or she's an alum of the Quaker Voluntary Service. We have Jesse joining us in Vermont. Hi, Jesse. Um, and we have, oh my goodness, Andrea from Memphis, Tennessee. We have uh, Alicia Cannon from New Jersey. Oh, well, we know that you're in New Jersey, Alicia. Okay, <laughs> I see you. Um, so we have a lot of great people, and I just want to shout out that I have been taking selfies this whole time with my Oprah phone case, so I hope you've been joining us doing that too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, do we have anyone, Bobby, on... Uh, YouTube, or did I get that right? I'm getting this wrong. YouTube, yes. <laughs> Bobby, yes. anyone on YouTube that's- Yes, tons out. of people on YouTube. We have uh, Karina Owens from North Carolina. We've got Margaret Moran from, uh, who was a McAllister student in Minnesota. We have so many folks from all across the country, including back out in California too. So back to you, Larissa. Thank you. Uh, keep reminding us that you're here. Keep letting us know you're here. Take those pictures. Um, send them to us. I'll just say it one more time. QuakerLobby at gmail.com. Um, so I think we're going to now jump over to the, uh, like I mentioned earlier, bulk of the training. So we have a bunch of information now at our disposal. Um, and if you were not, you know, fully paying attention or taking notes or you're thing, thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I don't remember everything that was just said. Don't worry, we have a bunch of resources that we're gonna share with you later where you can just kind of very quickly find that information. But for now, I wanna jump over to talking about the importance of storytelling. Um, so at this point, I am sure that you've noticed 
how often we have mentioned stories, the importance of telling your story. As constituent lobbyists, our stories are the power that we have when we walk to, or when we talk to a congressional office. You do not have to be an expert in the policy in order to be an effective lobbyist. Let me tell you right now, not even members of Congress are experts in a lot of policy. Um, they might have a couple policy issues that they are really passionate about, but we're all only human, right? We can only hold so much information in our heads. And so members of Congress rely on staffers to brief them and advocates like all of us to tell them what is happening in the communities that they represent. When change needs to happen, our stories are what help make the problems real for legislators that are often faced with numbers, statistics, and you know a lot is thrown at them at one time every day. And so we have the power to actually tell them what's going on back home because they might not actually know. What, um, now, you know, you might be wondering what I mean by story exactly. Your story is basically the answer to this question. Why? Very simple. Why do you care about climate change? Why are you watching this live stream right now? Uh, you know, why do you want to advocate and use your voice to affect change on the Hill? I want to encourage you all to be creative. A story does not have to be an experience that impacted you or your community directly. Um, it can obviously be that, but it can also relate to values and urgency. And don't worry, in a little bit, um, I will be welcoming Alicia Cannon again to join us and share some more prompts with you all in order for you to get started thinking about what your story might be. Um, because if you don't have a personal impact story, you might be struggling to to think about what you might say. And so hopefully we can give you some guidance in figuring that out. So my story is actually an example of a story that is not about personal impact, but rather the urgency that I feel related to the climate crisis and what compelled me to care about this issue. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pretend that I'm lobbying right now so you can hear what this is gonna sound like. So I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm going to go ahead and say that I am lobbying Senator Toomey. So here we go. I can say, hi, Senator Toomey. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. I'm here today to talk to you about climate change. Um, you know, it's an issue that I care deeply about ever since elementary school. My parents made me sit down and watch this documentary film called An Inconvenient Truth from Al Gore. And this documentary, I think in their minds was going to teach me about climate change. And I'm sure they didn't mean to scare me, but what I learned did scare me, especially as a little kid who didn't know what to do. And here I was being told that the future held a lot of natural destruction. Now this was 14 years ago. And I am even more scared now that we are facing the same crisis. And I have now seen some of this natural destruction uh, that I learned about and am frustrated that not much is being done to stop it. I personally feel that one way to address the climate crisis and um, to take a step in the right direction is carbon pricing. I'm not sure, Senator, how much you know about carbon pricing, but it is a way to cut carbon emissions by a significant amount. And uh, for that reason, I'm here to ask you to co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019. And it's over. Uh, notice that I did not mention many numbers or figures. Um, I very casually went through the fact that I was scared, the fact that I wanted action to be taken. I didn't feel like there was action being taken. Um, now, I did this on purpose. You know, I, I on purpose kept it not so technical because I really wanted to show you that you can lobby with an emphasis on your story as opposed to anything else. Um, now, we just gave you a lot of awesome information. So this doesn't mean that I am telling you to ignore the last couple hours that we spent together. Um, 
definitely insert some of the facts and talking points that we're giving you today and tomorrow. Um, but really what I, I'm trying to say is that you should not be nervous if you forget something. Um, if you forget the numbers, if you forget the specifics of the bill, again, we have resources to help you, but also just remember your story because ultimately, if nothing else comes out of your mouth, it should be your story and asking them to co-sponsor this piece of legislation. Um, now I am gonna hand it over to Leash, like I mentioned, so that she can model another type of story. Hers is more of a personal impact story. So you'll get to kind of hear another style. And another thing that you'll hear is that she will go into more detail of the legislation. So I kept it vague. She will not keep it so vague, and that way you can hear um, an even more refined version of what your story could sound like. So I will just go ahead and hand it over to Leash. All right, thanks, Larissa. Um, so I'm really excited to share my story. So the point of me doing this is the one prep you on how to sh share a personal impact story and also how to time yourselves so you're under two minutes. Some, that might seem like a lot of time, but when you're telling something that you know a lot about, it goes by really quickly. So I'm gonna pull out my phone, go cats, um, and put a timer, set a stopwatch. Ooh. Oh my gosh, there we go. I'm gonna set it and hopefully I stay under two minutes. Now we're going to start the scene. So in hindsight, my climate change journey started in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in 2012. During the hurricane, a 100-year-old oak tree fell on my bedroom, leaving a massive dent. Now, luckily, I was in the living room, but I will never forget the sound that tree made. Now, on top of that, there were seven other downed trees between me, our house, and the main road, cutting us off from civilization for 15 days and leaving us without power for 15 days. Now, I didn't find it odd that to the day, a year before, we were stuck inside because of a substantial blizzard. I didn't find it odd that this was the second year in a row that they had to cancel Halloween because of inclement weather. I was experiencing climate change before I had the words to process it or articulate it. So if we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, like terrible unprecedented storms will continue to ravage our community, like mine in South Brunswick, New Jersey, our nation and our world. That is why I hope your boss can co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019. So this bill is incredible. It puts a strong $15 price on carbon and the emissions reduction goals exceed our Paris Climate Agreement goals. It is great. It also has revenue uses that protects vulnerable communities, which is something I'm particularly passionate about. We're running out of time. We're in a climate emergency and that's why I hope that your boss can co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019 his co-sponsorship will send a signal that we need to be uh, have a more sustainable future. All right, so I'm in at 42. So I'm a fast talker because I'm from New Jersey, so I have time to slow down. Also, I hope that you saw that I shared my personal story. I hopefully got them to feel bad for my house. And then I quickly tied it right into the ass to make sure they know why I'm there. I'm not just there because a tree fell 12 years ago. So I always joke that I have the easy story. I was personally impacted by climate change. How could I not care? But there are three other stories if you weren't hit by a hurricane and you don't have that experience to tell. So the first one is a story that connects with your, your identity. So this could be you as a young person, you as a person of faith, you as a Quaker, you as a student, or a person of color. So this just I shows connects climate change and your identity. The second one is something that I think is really important. Think of yourself as like Greta Thunberg, a story that reflects the need to advocate in this moment, a story that reflects the urgency, or a story that can reflect why the US has a moral responsibility to address climate change since we're the greatest historical emitter of greenhouse gases. And the last one is a story that highlights the benefits of carbon pricing le legislations. This is for all you policy wonks out there or like people like me who do this for a living. All right, those are a lot. Don't worry, they're online too. And we have our first story from Sierra Cottle, a former advocacy corps member from Arizona. Hi everyone. Am I on? Awesome. So 
I have always been a huge fan of the outdoors and my story is going to kind of go into that. I'll be talking with my representative Rep Gosar. Um, so I've always been a big fan of the outdoors. I grew up climbing trees, playing outside, running around hiking, playing in the mud. But one of my first memories actually has to do with seeing a, the place that I love change forever because that first memory happened in 2002 when I'm sure you remember representative that um, a big fire came through the Prescott National Forest. I remember having to pack in a hurry with my family, um, pack up the goldfish, which was not an easy task, and leave. And a lot of people lost their houses. Luckily, my family was safe. Um, we got out and when we returned to the house, which was covered in ash, that we found the fire had um, gotten about a thousand feet from our house. At the time, I really didn't see the bigger picture of that or how this was all connected. I didn't realize that the big towering ponderosa pine trees that I'd grown up loving would never return to the area that the fire hit just because the climate does not allow for them to regrow. As I grew up, I developed a really huge passion for the environment. Um, and I realized that climate change has impacts on us that are different for everyone. And so I went and I studied environmental science in college. When I studied environmental science in college, I learned that just you know, 60 miles south of where we are, we have communities that are struggling to pay their electric bills and numerous heat related deaths in the summer just because the summers are getting longer. And then where we are, the fire seasons are getting longer. Our, um, our fire seasons are getting longer. There's a increased severity and frequency of, of those fires. And so I've really discovered that putting a price on carbon would help all people who are impacted by climate change, no matter how we are impacted by climate change. And I really do think that the, what is it, the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019 would help um, everyone in the state. And that's my story. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Sierra. Um, so I think now we're going to hear a story from Denise Chavez from East Tennessee State University. Hi, Larissa. Hi, everyone. Hi, Denise. Um, so my story, well, I'm from Guayaquil, Ecuador. And when I say Guayaquil, people don't usually know where it, where it is. So I'm going to talk about the Galapagos, which is my, a place that maybe more people are familiar with. So um, the theory of evolution has its origins over in the Galapagos, which is an area that is rapidly being affected by the climate change. This has to do because it's in a place of intersection of the three oceans and the current of El Nino is getting worse and more extreme with heating in the seas getting worse. So uh, in simple words, the climate change is threatening the existence of Darwin's critters. But I know that's far away in South America. So how does that affect us here in the United States? And how is it in Tennessee, where I go to school? So for Tennessee, the annual pre precipitation has increased for like around 5% since half of the 20th century. The average rainfall has increased and the rising percentage of that rainfall is falling within a very short period of time. So I'm an entry in the health department and I have seen how nurses that had to do home visits to people in rural communities are not able to either see their patients or deliver medicine that the people needed due to road closures. And in some cases, they go through the road closures just to be able to help their patients, but they also put at risk their life. Now, uh, flooding is not the only way in which Tennesseans have been affected. Uh, Tennesseans have also seen a rise in temperatures. And with rising temperatures, there is more water evaporation. And I just want to bring it into perspective. Around 45% of the Tennessee's land is used for agriculture and farming. Now imagine the impact of this uh, drought or, or lack of rain and then sometimes flooding, how much of that affects these communities. Now again, that's 45% of the land in Tennessee. So 
the change in climate is likely to reduce uh, crop yields and it threatens the aquatic ecosystem, increases risk for human health. So I'm proud that we're lobbying or learning how to lobby to our elected representatives to take action to vote for the climate action rebate of 2018. And that's it. Thank you, Denise. And I'm very impressed with all of the numbers that uh, you just shared with us. So um, that's great because uh, you know I think we just heard, um, we have another story coming up, but these two stories that we just heard, you know, you can see the differences in, um, in, in the styles, right? So Sierra shared a more personal story about her life and, and kind of like painted a picture of uh, more of an anecdotal type of um, lobby visit. And then Denise went into more specifics about, um, you know, where she's from, but also with numbers, did some more research. So two very different styles, but both effective. And it's really what makes you most comfortable. And it's really just what is your story? What's gonna come naturally to you? There's no wrong way to do that. So we have another story coming from Carly Fitz from Wilmington College um, from Ohio. Carly, do you wanna share your story? Yeah, um, hello everyone. I'm Carly and I'm calling in from Glenford, Ohio, which is a rural community in Appalachia, Ohio. So I come from a community that has been deeply rooted in agriculture. Most of the people in our community, these jobs rely on this industry. And as you know, it's very uncertain because we rely so heavily on Mother Nature. Denise really put a good term on it um, when she said that so many people are indebted to this because they can't access the roads. So for example, whenever we have any significant amount of rainfall, um, half of our roads in the community are flooded. Um, people can't get to their jobs. and there's just a lot of uncertainty surrounding it, and it, then it puts our fields, which then delays our um, harvest time, which then delays the food chain, and there's just so many people relying on us every day that these uncertainties that we can help control in some way can be avoided. On the flip side of that, there's also drought. So drought comes into our communities usually in the summertime, and it takes away from the nutrients of our crops and grains, and it takes away from the forages that our animals might be able to eat. So for me and my family, we have sheep on our farm, and we were actually experiencing this over the summer due to the increased uh, rainfalls, the nutrients in our hay was down. So then our sheep were at a nutrient deficiency, which then cuts into our profit margins, which then prevents us from being able to help our community and giving back in those ways. We are at a situ we're in a situation when we, when we are at the mercy of Mother Nature. And for example, just this morning, the wind caused my power to go out. So I know there's not much that we can do about some of these uncertain things, but if we were to work with Congress on passing this act, we can cause change and we are capable of it. Um, that's why I'm here today with the people with Spring Lobby Weekend and we are so pleased to be working with each other and I can't wait to see what else we are capable of accomplishing this weekend. Thank you so much, Carly. And uh, thank you for joining us, even though you just said your power went out this morning. I'm so glad mm -hmm. that, <laughs> that you still managed to join us for Spring Lobby Weekend. Um, yeah. So uh, Leish, do you have any other thoughts that you wanna share with everyone about the stories we just heard, maybe a couple more best practices before we move on to uh, hearing other stories. I think Facebook and YouTube are blowing up with some stories that people wanna share, but what are you thinking right now, Leish? I have a few thoughts. Um, so I know both of us, we do these lobby trainings with different groups and some things that I love to tell to anyone that's listening is that your member of Congress like has to listen to you. This is their job. Um, I think some people, can get scared because Congress can seem like this very abstract thing in DC that no one can touch. But really, constituents have more power than Emily and I do sometimes. They can get into offices that we can't. And it's really important that people use this power and voice their opinions. I was an intern on the Hill. I loved constituent phone calls, especially when they were nice to me. And it was really empowering to hear that people cared. So that's one thing that I just 
I think people get some nervous. It's like, this is their job. They have to listen to you. And it's great that you feel politically empowered to do so. The second thing I want to say is that climate change intersects with so many other issue areas, which you can learn more about tomorrow during our other sessions. But if you think you don't have a story that necessarily connects with what we what you just heard right now, you can talk about climate change and immigration. If that if immigration is your thing, it intersects, trust me. And my good friend Carlos could be talking about it tomorrow. It's you can find your story. It might not pop to you immediately, but trust me, it's out there. Again, I was I'm easy. I got hit by a hurricane. <laughs> Um, thank you, Leesh. Yeah, the, uh, previewing what we're going to do tomorrow is really good for right now because, yes, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to say, we thought this through. And there will be a lot of opportunities tomorrow for you all to learn more about the intersectionality of climate change and other issues because, like Leesh said, uh, one example is climate change and immigration. Um, we have climate change in agriculture. We've actually heard a couple agriculture questions, including Carly's story. Um, we will have a whole workshop dedicated to that tomorrow. So please take a look. Um, when we get there, I'll preview even more what the workshops look like. But if you take a look and something kind of uh, sparks your interest, definitely go so that you can start better forming what your story is and why you care. Um, another thing that I wanted to say, you know, as I'm hearing these stories is definitely bringing it back to your home community. So I think everyone basically did that, but I just really want to emphasize that um, it's not just, uh, hi, I'm Larissa, thank you so much uh, for meeting with me and let me just jump in. I did technically do that earlier because I, I did not uh, model the whole thing, but, you know, if I had been in a visit, I probably at the beginning would have given even more information about who I am, where in Pennsylvania do I live, letting Senator Toomey know, I am one of your constituents, you represent me and let me kind of just, you know, find some of that common ground with you. And I heard Carly say this when she was telling her story, reminding everyone on the visit that you're here for Spring Lobby Weekend, you're advocating with hundreds of other people. So it's really bringing it down to that human element of who you are, where you're from, and the fact that you're coming as part of a group, as part of, uh, part of a movement. So let's hear some other stories that we are getting from Facebook and YouTube. Let's jump over to, uh, I think, let's go with Bobby. Um, Bobby on YouTube, do you have stories to share with us that other people are sharing on there? Absolutely, we've got a few here. Um, Andrea shares, I want to lobby about climate change because I don't wanna watch the mass suffering that could happen across the globe. I wanna be able to have a family. Another person, Ashlyn Simon shares, I'm really happy to hear I'm not the only one that is here partly because they were scared by an inconvenient truth in elementary school. Shout out to you, Larissa. Oh, amazing. Um, you know, I wasn't sure if anyone would relate to that story, but I'm glad I got one of you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bobby. And I mean, you know, uh, Leash mentioned it earlier today, climate anxiety is a real thing. And if that's all that your brain keeps landing on is, I'm just really scared, honestly. That's your story. Do not be afraid to lean into that. So Annie, um, I think we might have a story or two from you on YouTube. I'm yeah, sorry, Facebook. On oh Facebook. my God, I get it wrong every time. Facebook. It's okay. It's all the internet. But yeah, I'm here on Facebook and I've got a couple, I, you know, some, some individuals are sharing that they have asthma um, and as a result, clean air is so important to them. Um, and, you know, I think we all on our weather apps will get those notifications of days when it says um, this is not a good day to be outside if you are um, in a group of people who have more sensitive lungs or sen sensitivity to air pollution. Um, so I think that's definitely something that we can all relate to. Um, and then we have Christine who says, um, I just want to remind you that there are some, although this spring lobby weekend is primarily for younger adults, we do have some older friends joining us, um, and I'm so thrilled with that. Um, Christine says, I have five children ages 16 and up, and I'm not all the way clear that they will experience the waterways and the forests and the blue skies of today in 2030. They are the reason why I must uplift my voice for this government to take climate change seriously and bring meaningful policies into every facet of our economy and our natural world. So just a reminder to all you young adults out there that you have some older adult advocates with us joining us in solidarity today. So thank you so much, Christine. 
Thank you, Annie. And um, before we move on, I do want to remind all of you, Leash mentioned that the prompts that uh, we have for you are listed on the website. Actually, um, Leash, why don't we have you read those prompts one more time? Um, I'll give you a moment to just uh, you know, pull them up, but they are on fcnl.org slash SLW, um, just because obviously we're saying a lot uh, today and we wanna make sure that you know, if you wanna think about your story tonight or tomorrow morning, the prompts are on there for you to review even after we're done here. So Leesh, do you wanna just say those prompts one more time to keep people thinking about their stories? Sure. So the first one is a personal impact story. So something that um, involves you, your community, something that ties you to the district. Um, another one would be a story that connects, you, connects with your identity. So you as a young person, as a student, a person of faith or a person of color, some, something that ties those two together. Um, a story that reflects the urgency of this moment, the need to advocate in this moment. So the fact that we have less than 10 years to do something about this, or that the United States has a moral obligation to address climate change in some way. And then lastly, a story that highlights the benefits of carbon pricing. So this could be saying that there are 27 Nobel Prize winners who think this is a great thing to do. And you can go down on the policy wonk side. So those are four different ways that you can connect climate change to your story. Thank you, Leish. And it looks like we have another question from Annie on Facebook. Annie, do you wanna share that question? Yeah, absolutely. I have Margaret here. She says, how will our storytelling based lobbying impact our representatives, our representatives if we end up meeting with not the representative himself or, or themselves, but rather someone from their staff? So the question is really about you know, how are these stories going to be taken in and how will it make it to the representatives themselves if in fact you're meeting with one of their staffers instead of the elected official? Larissa, I have a great story about this. Okay, uh, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, so Emily and I got to train 30 middle schoolers about climate change and they're going to meet their representative on the Capitol steps this was the week of the climate strikes. It was big for climate change. And we were really excited. We trained them. They were, they were so thrilled. Um, and unfortunately, the member could not make it. But we recorded the video of the kids doing the lobby training to their environmental staffer. The environmental staffer was awesome. She took all the kids' questions. It, was, it ended up being quite lovely. Um, Greta Thunberg actually walked by. It was a phenomenal day. Um, and they also had handwritten letters that they gave to the staffer who then she promised to give to the member. And so I think the kids were a bit bummed that they didn't meet the member, but still politically empowered because they told their member of Congress why they should join the, the Climate Solutions Caucus and why they cared about climate change. It was great. Um, so then fast forward two days later, it's the day of the climate strikes. Emily and I are marching in DC. Um, we finally check our emails and we find out that the member of Congress actually did join the Climate Solutions Caucus and he cited the kids as the reason why he joined. And so whenever I'm talking to a group who doesn't necessarily believe in their own power, I tell them that 30 middle schoolers who told their member of Congress that they're afraid that their favorite beach is going to wash away got him to join the Climate Solutions Caucus. It was incredible. And then even crazier, the member went to their school in Virginia and sat down with them for 30 minutes to talk about climate change and help them learn about the Revolutionary War, which was just hilarious. So even if you're talking to the staffer, it works. The information gets to the member. And especially since you're a constitu constituent, it sometimes, even in, like, in the morning, they'll have um, a specific staffer talk about what constituents are concerned about. And it's like a weekly roundup and they count how many times a certain issue is talked about. So whatever you're doing, emailing, tweeting, talking to them, it works. It gets to the member. That was a bit of a rant. <laughs> no, that was perfect. Um, and I'm so glad you told that story, Alish, because I, uh, you and I did a lobby training. Um, well, we, we were two of the people doing this lobby training um, on climate change. And I remember you telling that story and it was the first time I had heard it. And now I tell that story a lot too, <laughs> because it's a great story. Um, it's really wonderful because not only does it show that anyone can be a lobbyist, again, you do not 
have to be an expert in the policy. You just have to be passionate and know your story and be confident enough to put yourself out there to have that conversation with the member of Congress or the staffer. Um, and yeah, you stole the words right out of my mouth. Uh, the, the advice I was going to give was kind of going back to what I said earlier, which was that, you know, members of Congress rely very heavily on their staffers to inform them of an issue, to give them details of legislation that they might not have had a chance to look over. So all of that information that comes from other, um, yeah, from other constituents, even though it's going to a staffer, will eventually reach the member of Congress. Um, so thank you for that story, Leash. I, I, it's honestly my, one of my favorite things. <laughs> so um, I think you all saw while she was speaking, there was a, a little clip next to her face that kind of was letting you all know, we do want you to, if you're comfortable, record your story and send it to us. Um, so just like I was encouraging people to take selfies earlier, please keep doing that. Um, record your story. And this will be a good way for you to practice, first of all. Um, but second, one of the things that I really love about the in-person Spring Lobby Weekend event is actually getting to meet you all, hear your stories, and, and kind of finding a solidarity in that community. So it makes me sad that I can't hear as many stories um, because we are not in person, but we obviously are finding ways to share with each other anyway. And one of those ways is to practice your story by recording it, have someone else record it for you, and send it to us at quakerlobby at gmail.com. Again, quakerlobby at gmail.com. Any pictures that you take are also, should uh, you should send them to that email address. And... Um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, yes. Well, if you uh, submit your story, please be comfortable with us possibly playing it tomorrow when we get started at noon um, so that everyone that has joined us can get uh, even a better sense of what stories are out there and who, again, is joining and who's taking action together. Um, so for now, I want to thank you, Leash, again, for joining me to share out some stories and best practices. And I think we're going to have time for just one more before we move on to a quick 30-second break. And then we have another awesome speaker. So let's go to Bobby on YouTube again for one more story to kind of tie this all together. Thanks, Bobby. Absolutely. in Connecticut that in my previous job as a camp counselor for low-income communities led to camp cancellations, which led to families dependent on lunch provided without food. Thank you. Okay, again, practice your story. Share it with us if you're comfortable. Um, for now, let's take another quick stretch break. And when we come back, we're going to have an awesome speaker, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, who will be talking about climate change and justice. So we'll be right back. Alrighty, welcome back. Like I said, we are about to dive into learning about climate change and um, environmental justice. So we are thrilled to have with us Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. He is a renowned thought leader, international speaker, policymaker, community liaison, trainer, and facilitator. Dr. Santiago Ali serves as the Vice President of Environmental Justice Climate and Community Revitalization for the National Wildlife Federation. Ha, huh, mouthful. He is also the founder of Revitalization Strategies, a business focused on moving our most vulnerable communities from surviving to thriving. 
Before joining the National Wildlife Federation, Mustafa was the senior vice president for the Hip Hop Caucus, a national nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that connects the hip hop community to the civic process to build power and create positive change. Prior to joining the Hip Hop Caucus, Mustafa worked for 24 years at the US Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Um, Mustafa uses a holistic approach to revitalizing vulnerable communities, and he has worked with more than 500 domestic and international communities to secure environmental health and economic justice. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Thank you so much for being with us today. How's it oh, doing? Oh, there you go. Yes. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to the incredible uh, lobbying weekend that everyone is pulling together. Thank you for your advocacy uh, and getting engaged uh, in the process that helped to make real change happen. You know, when I started working on social justice issues when I was 16 years old, there was not a lot of young people at that time uh, who were focusing uh, on many of the issues that all of us care about. So, you know, you're truly blessed uh, to be able to surround yourself with all these incredible young thought leaders, change makers, solutionaries, which is something that we definitely need today. And yes, you know, we have some real serious things that are going on you know, in the moment that we are currently living in. Climate change is one of them, COVID-19 is another one. All of these things are actually connected and we have an opportunity to actually, to help to change the world, uh, to make it a better and more inclusive place uh, and to make real change actually happen. You know, sometimes we forget about our most vulnerable communities. Lots of times now we'll hear vulnerable communities in the press in relationship uh, to what's going on with the coronavirus and we talk about our elders, but we also have to be focused on um, our most vulnerable communities, communities of color, lower income communities and indigenous peoples. And you know, for far too many years, those communities were actually ignored. And there's a connection in that space to climate change, of course. If you think about where the majority of the fossil fuel facilities are located, they're located in communities of color and lower income communities. Uh, when you think about the fossil fuel infrastructure, in many instances, that's running through farmer's land, that's running through indigenous lands, that's ending up on the Gulf Coast in, in some instances in places like Louisiana and, and Texas and Mississippi uh, and ending up in communities of color. And sometimes we need to actually anchor um, our experiences in the facts to help people to understand how serious this moment is but also the sets of opportunities that actually exist for us to make real change. You know, we've got 100,000 people who are dying prematurely from air pollution in our country every year. And actually that's the conservative number. And we know that disproportionately it's African-American and Latinx communities um, and lower income and working class white communities that are being impacted from this. And we also know that we've got 25 million folks in our country who have asthma. We've got 7 million kids and it's African-American and Latinx communities who are utilizing the emergency rooms um, in many instances, unfortunately, losing their lives because of the impacts from asthma. So let's think about the moment that we're currently in with COVID-19. If you have a pre-existing condition, and if you look at many of these communities that have had coal-fired power plants or incinerators or waste treatment facilities, a number of different types of polluting industries, these are the communities that have these underlying health conditions, these long-term chronic conditions. And we also know that that makes them more susceptible uh, to what's going on right now with the coronavirus. So our work on climate change would mean that we are addressing the issues that are happening inside of these communities. And hopefully it will help us to deal with some of these challenges that we continue to see. Our work is also connected to the fact that we have medically underserved areas where there are not hospitals or clinics for people to get to. So if you wanna talk about COVID-19, you see that there's a challenge in that space, but let's also think about all the impacts that each and every one of us have seen over the last few years, from wildfires to hurricanes, to these extreme rain events and floods that continue to happen, to these heat events that are also 
doing all kinds of damage to many people inside of our community. So if we're not also focusing on the healthcare needs that are in that space, we know that we've got 80 million people in our country who are either uninsured or underinsured. And we know that as more and more of the challenges that climate change, the climate emergency will bring that we have to also be thinking about how does this play out in our climate strategy? How do we make sure that we are actually helping communities to build the infrastructure that's gonna be necessary for them to be able to survive and actually move from surviving to thriving? We also need to think about the impacts that are happening to our water bodies. Um, and you know, right now folks are telling folks that you gotta wash your hands and you know, use soap and water, but I want you to think about some of the challenges that are currently going on across our country. Many of us are blessed that when we turn on our tap, there's water coming out. There are far too many communities where that is not their reality. There are also far too many communities whose well water has been tainted or, you know, poisoned by all kinds of different chemicals. And also there are places where the water table has changed so that they no longer um, can actually utilize the wells, especially in rural communities. I come from Appalachia and was raised a little bit in Michigan. So I know some of the challenges that rural communities face uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is now our time. And that's why I'm so excited to be here with you guys. You know, sometimes out of a negative comes a positive. And out of this negative, we have now put a spotlight on all of the challenges um, that still need to be addressed inside of our country. And we get the opportunity to actually help to flame, frame out what a new direction looks like. When you're there lobbying, and I worked for two years on Capitol Hill and was blessed to be there because I was always wondering, why don't we have environmental justice legislation? The communities would always ask me that question. And I wanted to figure out how do we actually make that a reality? You know, now we're blessed that we have environmental justice bills that are in the House, we have folks both on the Senate and the House side who are championing the issues of frontline communities. But the most important thing is to actually work in authentic collaboration with frontline communities. We don't ever want to parachute in. We want to make sure that folks know that we are there with them in solidarity, that we are understanding and listening to the challenges that they are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis so that our lobbying efforts, so that the legislation that's being created, whether on the federal level or on the state level, is actually reflective of what folks are asking for. Our new energy sources that we will utilize, especially green energy sources, we need to make sure that there's real equity in that process. If you look at most of the new businesses that are currently being built in the green energy space, very few of those are actually owned by folks of color. So we've got some work to do in that space to actually make sure that equality is truly represented and that we're not taking the old fossil fuel paradigm and moving it to a green paradigm. We've got a chance to actually make real change happen. And in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, someone who was there long before any of us were born, but his words still resonate. When he said that we come to these shores in different ships, we're all in the same boat now. We're in this climate change boat. We're in this boat dealing with the pandemic. But the beauty is when we all come together, we can force real change to happen. Doesn't matter if we're Democrat or Republican or independent, we can make change happen. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a couple questions for you, of course. And the first question that we have is from Jamila Lewis, who is calling in from Las Vegas, Nevada. Jamila, thank you so much for being with us. Hi, um, thank you so much, Mr. Um, Ali, Santiago Ali, for speaking with us. It has been great hearing you and learning from you. Um, I kind of went and did a little research on your Twitter feed, so thank you for posting some informational and great content. Um, and it's a hum humbling experience to meet you. Um, as Larissa said, I'm Jamila, and I'm a local Nevadan, a community advocate, and an advocacy corps member. And after you hearing you speak and doing a little bit of research, as I stated, my question is, how will the carbon tax beneficially impact communities of color? And more broadly, what role should the federal government play in addressing environmental racism? Thank you. Yeah, so, okay. 
let's start with the first one. Um, so in relationship to the carbon tax, it really depends on how it is structured. And again, it goes back to making sure that frontline communities, that environmental justice organizations and networks are a part of the framing out of that. We have to always be very careful that we make the assumption that we know what is best for folks. Folks know, um, you know, we have indigenous uh, knowledge that comes from our Native American brothers and sisters. We have, you know, uh, huge amounts of experience that come from folks living on the Gulf Coast and from the Rust Belt and in Appalachia. So for all that, what I'm saying is that we have to make sure that when we're talking about a carbon tax that is representative of what they're asking for. I actually had a chance to jump on earlier and I heard some people talking about how uh, the current piece of legislation that you all are focusing on actually will move resources back to frontline communities, which is extremely important in helping to build the uh, capacity and infrastructure that's gonna be necessary. The one thing that I always share with folks, whether we're talking about a carbon tax or we're talking about cap and trade, is that for our most vulnerable communities, we have to always make sure that we're not creating additional hot spots um, because we've had these sacrifice zones for years inside of communities of color and lower wealth communities. We just wanna make sure that whatever we move forward on is not going to um, you know, create additional ones or entrench the ones that already exist. And the other question, I'm sorry, uh, on environmental racism, and thank you for raising that. So the, um, you know, the federal government has a huge role to play in that, uh, in the sense that, you know, they are utilizing people's tax dollars. So folks' tax dollars should never be used to pollute folks, should never be used to keep these systemic uh, types of racial biases uh, moving forward and finding fertile ground. So whether it's the Department of Justice, getting more engaged when you have an administration who uh, values that, whether it's the EPA making sure that we no longer are creating, you know, uh, uh, environmental apartheid situations. We have all of these various federal agencies. And just real quickly, as I close out, there are 17 federal agencies and departments that have a distinct responsibility for environmental justice. So they need to do their job. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jamila, for that question. Um, I actually have a question. I've been told I am allowed, in fact, to ask you a question. <laughs> so um, I was really excited for you to be here. Thank you so much. I read some of your uh, pieces on the intersectionality issues of the COVID-19 response, which you kind of alluded to. Um, and, you know, I, I found that writing to be really important. So I'm glad that you mentioned it. And if any of you have not read um, his work on that, uh, the, I think there were two that I read that were published recently, but I heard you say that one of the most important things is to have, maybe I got this right, an authentic collaboration with frontline communities when addressing these problems. And that really resonated with me. It's something that I'm trying to think about a lot in my own work. And I'm wondering if there are any organizations that you can point us to that maybe you think have the perfect model, maybe not perfect, but already do this really well. Um, they are in fact, maybe even led by these frontline communities. Um, just any other organizations or resources out there that you think get it right that we can maybe take a look at after. Sure. Well, I always say that every organization has the opportunity to get it right if they're willing to make the investment, you know, and that starts with, you know, properly partnering uh, with the environmental justice networks that are already out there. They are all across the country. There are incredible organizations that are underneath. If you're on the West Coast, you know, you have organizations like APEN. Um, uh, the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, you have the Indigenous Environmental Network, you have organizations in New York like WEAC, um, and also uh, UPROSE um, that uh, Elizabeth Yon Pierre runs. Um, there literally are hundreds and hundreds of these uh, frontline networks and organizations that are out there. And for each and every organization, it's a matter of creating the space. Um, to make sure that those organizations um, are part of sort of what's going on and you are part of what they are doing um, and then building into your structure, um, you know, the work that needs to happen so that we can really win on climate change. Because here's the reality, everyone. You know, I, I've been working on these issues for a while now. We cannot win on climate change 
if we don't win on environmental justice. And the reason being is that, you know, whether we're talking about transportation routes, and you've seen recently that the Environmental Protection Agency decided that they are no longer going to enforce environmental laws um, as we're dealing with the pandemic. You've seen over 90 um, pieces of environmental justice legislation, statutes, all these various types of things that have been rolled back, all of this stuff. Um, is a part of the struggle that many of these organizations have been dealing with sometimes for 20, 30, 40 years. And for us to have authentic collaborative partnerships means that we all have an opportunity to come together um, and figure out where we have commonalities um, and be able to have this unified force that makes real change happen. You guys, I was listening earlier real quickly as I close out that, you know, I've been blessed, you know, to work with incredible young leaders from the Sunrise Movement and This Is Zero Hour and, you know, the Fridays Movement and Extinction and all these other folks. Um, and it's amazing. It's amazing what happens when we all come together. Um, and we've seen the marches and you saw the millions of people who have taken to the streets across the planet. All of that is because people have put away, you know, those old sins of the past of thinking that we couldn't work together, that that's your issue and this is my issue. What we're working on are human issues and we have the opportunity to actually save. We have a chance to save our planet, but we're also trying to save our people because what if we saved the planet and there were no people? It wouldn't make a lot of sense. So all of these things are super important. It's all connected and we can win. Interesting way to put that. Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. <laughs> So I think we have a couple more questions for you. Um, Bobby on YouTube, I think has one or two questions, Bobby. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so Aurelio Anderson from Florida asks, how does the Hip Hop Caucus use its connections to hip hop to contribute to the climate change movement? Is there a specific example or a cool story there? Wow, I'm so glad Aurelio that you asked that question because uh, I didn't know how much time I had to talk. So the Hip Hop Caucus is, is an incredible organization that's run by Reverend Lennox Yearwood. Uh, it's been around it's celebrating its 15th anniversary now. There were four different organizations that, that came together to create the Hip Hop Caucus. And the Hip Hop Caucus actually does a couple of things. One, it focuses on voting, which is so incredibly important and in getting people engaged in the civic process. The other part is on the environmental side and the climate side and, and working with artists and entertainers um, to you know, you work with them so that they utilize their platforms uh, to help to drive change, uh, to get content and, and, you know, sort of increased and included uh, in many of the, you know, their artistic uh, endeavors as well. So, you know, the caucus has been a part of so many things from campus tours and bringing artists there, having roundtables and also concerts. And here's the reality. <laughs> it, it is kind of interesting. So I've been blessed. I probably know some of the, the top scientists around the world. And if they share something, about 10% of people pay attention. And, you know, and that's cool. But if Beyonce says something, then millions and millions of people, you know, pick up their phone and they want to know more. So it also goes back to that authentic partnerships because, you know, as artists and entertainers get more engaged uh, and they get people interested in the issues, then you also partner with the other content experts so that we can go deeper into the process and we just continue to keep building. So the Hip Hop Caucus has been holding it down for a long time. Incredible artists, everybody from Common to Wiz Khalifa uh, to Anthony Smith. Uh, I can go down a laundry list of the folks who've been uh, engaged with the caucus over the years. So nothing but big ups to, to Rev and the whole uh, Hip Hop Caucus family. That is really awesome. And I am glad that you mentioned about, um, you know, just continuing to uh, emphasize that uh, building the, you know, having that authentic collaboration. We talk about building relationships, but we talk a lot about building relationships with our members of Congress. And clearly, you know, what you're indicating there is that building relationships within the movement is also very important, you know, because more people uh, rooting for the same thing is obviously better than just one person. So uh, we have another question from Bobby. Bobby, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kiara asks, what are some concrete direct ways putting a price on carbon will help with some of the problems you brought up? It's one step in a process towards a greener world. What specifically does this step do? Well, I think it does on uh, some of the things that are super important as we have the resources that are necessary 
then we can help to improve people's health, which is incredibly important. We can also uh, make sure that some of those resources are also helping to uh, enhance and, and open up the civic process and making sure that folks can better engage with what's going on at the local level and, and on the county level and on the state level, which is also super important. We can also utilize some of those resources to make sure that they're helping on the education side um, so that in our schools, that there is the content and the curricula that's necessary to educate and continue to educate uh, the next generation of folks who are gonna have to deal with all kinds of different situations that are gonna be you know, a result of the impacts of the climate emergency. You know, there are as many different possibilities as, the, you know, as there are folks who are engaged in this and we need to be able to sort of honor all of those with the resources um, that can come from this. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for asking so many awesome questions of all of our speakers. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to wrap up now. That seems to be all the time we have for questions for Dr. Santiago Ali. I want to thank you again so much for being here, sharing your, your knowledge, your expertise, your wisdom. And um, unless you want to say anything more, I think that we might go to a commercial break. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Power to the people. Bye. All right, so like I said, we're gonna take a quick other stretch break and we'll be right back to continue um, training and getting into more of that nitty gritty. Um, I know those commercial breaks are a little short, but I hope you are all uh, ready to keep going. We are now getting to, like I said, the training itself. Um, now, this is just part one of the training. Uh, we're going to get into what a lobby visit is going to look like. Obviously, um, you all will be calling in. These will not be in-person visits, so we'll make sure to give you everything you need for that um, in case maybe you already have experienced lobbying and you're not sure what it's going to look like now, we will get you ready. So I'm very happy to have, again, Emily Worsba, Leash Cannon, and we're going to welcome also in a little bit uh, Sergio Mata Cisneros, who works really closely with me on the Young Adult Program team. So I will hand it over to the three of you. Thank you all so much. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited because we're finally at the portion that you all have been waiting for, which is time for our lobby training. So what's going to happen is I'm going to walk us through kind of how lobbying via phone call is different than lobbying in person. Um, and then I'm going to walk us through the lobby visit roadmap. And then we're going to actually model a lobby visit phone call for you all. We'll do our own role play so you can really get a sense of how this might sound like and uh, what it's going to feel like. Um, so I think I just want to say from the very beginning that just because we're lobbying via conference calls, that doesn't mean it's any less important or effective as lobbying in person. You still have an incredible opportunity to have a conversation with the people that represent you in Congress. They are paying attention and listening. And the fact that so many congressional offices decided they still wanted to take these meetings just illustrates to me how important your visits will be and how climate change is a top issue for Congress right now. Um, so as a quick reminder and recap, now is the critical time to be talking to members of Congress about addressing climate change. Um, so just so you all know, the Senate um, and the House just passed a third stimulus package last week, but they're going to be working on um, a fourth package in the coming months because we know that um, the effects of coronavirus will have lasting impacts on our economy. But we also know that climate change will have lasting impacts on our economy and on human lives. And so Congress needs to continue to be hearing from constituents that building a clean energy economy and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and protecting vulnerable communities is essential. And as a reminder, what they hear from you all right now will determine what is possible for the actions they can take in 2021. And 
FCNL has always emphasized and really centered relationship building at the core of our lobbying. And I just want to be really clear that it is still possible to build a relationship with your congressional staff right now, even though you'll be on the phone. Email and phone interactions are another critical piece of doing that work, because the, the ultimate goal is to let them know that you care. So how does lobbying on the phone actually work? Um, in a few minutes, we'll walk through the lobby visit roadmap, but there are a couple of really important things I want you all to keep in mind as you're having your phone calls with congressional staff. So first, they'll all be taking place via conference call, phone calls. We're gonna ask you to call into the meeting, into the line 10 minutes before the time of your lobby visit is actually set to start. This is because we wanna make sure you have time to do a roll call, make sure everyone is there and on the line. You wanna do a sound check, make sure there's no background noise, make sure everyone knows how to mute and unmute themselves, um, and just to really feel prepared and centered. You also will wanna use this kind of 10 minute preparation chunk to prepare the list of delegation members for who is already gonna be on the call. That way you have that list of names ready to just email to the congressional staffer afterwards. Another logistical thing, if you're having any kind of problems with the phone call, if the, the staffer doesn't show up or maybe the number isn't working, FCNL has set up a phone line that you can text or call, we prefer text, um, if you're having any problems that we can help troubleshoot you with. Um, and this will be Justin Hurdle's number. Um, and I'm gonna give you his number right now. So get a piece of, get a piece of paper and a pen if you can, or, or type it out on your phone. His number is 815 608-5515. So I'm gonna say that one more time in case you miss it the first time. Justin Hurdle's number, which you can text if you're having any problems with your lobby visit phone call, 815-608-5515. Another thing to remember, uh, please speak very clearly because it'll be on a phone. It might be a little bit harder to hear or understand than normal. Um, and when you speak, self-identify each time. Say, hi, this is Emily again, and then say what you're going to say. Um, similarly, the group leader is going to be calling on people and kind of prompting people to speak. So be sure that you're um, paying really close attention when you fill out your lobby visit roadmap when we break out into state delegations in a little bit. We really want to make sure that um, everyone knows what the plan is and that you can stick to the script as much as possible. And then lastly, on the logistical end, don't worry if there are extra problems, if your dog barks in the middle of the phone call, if you hear some weird noises, because all of us are learning how to do this, including congressional staff. Um, this is the, a really unprecedented time that we're living in. Congressional staff are having to adjust to having all their meetings via phone call as well. So just be kind to yourself, be kind to others, be kind to the congressional staff. Um, everyone's stressed, everyone is learning, everyone is new at this. You all are gonna be great, I'm so excited. This is happening. Um, so I want to talk through the lobby visit roadmap. Um, again, this is just to help ensure that you feel as prepared as possible, that you have a plan for your visit and you kind of know who is saying what. So I want everyone to pull up the lobby visit roadmap document right now. Um, it should have been emailed to you, but if you can't find it, that's okay. Go to fcnl.org slash slw and you can find the document under the virtual lobbying tab. You might have to scroll down a little bit, but it's down there. Um, so please click on that document so everyone has it. Normally, when I do this in person, I make you physically wave the copy around. So just please make sure you have it pulled up. So the kind of first two, oh yeah, and, and right there. Oh, no, backwards fingers, okay. Can't do it, can't do it right this time. <laughs> I tried. Um, so the first thing you wanna do is have your delegation um, pick a group leader and a note taker. So these roles look a little bit different than if you maybe have done this with us in the past. So the group leader, it's even more important um, that you can keep track of time during the meeting. You're gonna be the one ultimately responsible for having the roadmap filled out for your group. Um, and then on the call, it's gonna be your job to prompt people by name um, in order so people know to speak as a sign. So the group leader, you're really gonna be facilitating the meeting and making sure everything gets done as needed. The note taker. So this is another crucial role. You're going to be taking notes on everything that the congressional staff say during the visit. And it's also your job to fill out the lobby visit report back form. This is so crucial to my job, to what Leash does. 
Because if we don't know what happened on your visit, it's kind of like it didn't happen, right? This is the opportunity for us to then know how are we gonna follow up on all of these amazing conversations that you all will be having on Tuesday. So make sure that you take a look at the Lobby Visit Roadmap because there are a few questions that we ask that we're gonna hope that you're able to answer specifically about things they said about carbon pricing, their stance on climate policy in general, and if they hear from constituents about this issue. The note taker is also gonna be responsible for making sure you have the names and contact information of everyone in the visit. Um, and then it's gonna be your job to actually send the follow-up email after the visit is done. So we provided a great template follow-up email that has all the information you just need to attach the lobby ask and the list of people in your visit. Um, so it's gonna be your job as a note taker to make sure that gets out. So group leader, note taker, two of the really big roles. But every role in the lobby visit is really important. And so what we're gonna do now is walk through that lobby visit roadmap. So if you scroll down to the second page of that form, it should be double-sided. Um, you'll see the, the place where you can actually fill out the lobby visit roadmap. So I'm gonna just walk us through what the flow of the meeting is. So at the beginning of the phone call, when the congressional staffer um, answers the phone, the group leader will be briefly introducing the delegation, uh, letting the staffer know that you're here as part of a virtual Spring Lobby Weekend Conference with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Um, and really importantly, the group leader will need to ask how much time the congressional staffer has for their phone call so they can calibrate the meeting accordingly. Um, and so as a reminder, you know, sometimes when you have in-person visits, everyone gets to go around and say their name and introduce themselves. That won't be the case um, necessarily unless you have a very small delegation. So then the second rule is that someone will say a thank you. This is a critically important role um, because it lets the office know that you're really there to have a productive and a respectful conversation with them. This thank you could be something related to climate change. If you can't find something related to climate change, it can be about any issue um, that you agree with them on. Um, you'd be surprised. It's, it's, you can pretty much find something always that you agree with them on. And at the very minimum, if you can't find anything to thank them for, thank them for taking the time to speak with constituents during this global pandemic, right? The fact that they're still prioritizing talking to constituents is a really big deal. And so we should honor that. So then the next rule, after you do the thank you, someone will introduce the ask. This is where you very clearly want to state what it is that a member of Congress is supposed to be doing. So our ask for this weekend is to co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act. If the staff take anything away from the meeting with you, it should be that you want them to co-sponsor this bill. It's really simple to say, do something on climate change, but that's not very specific. And the staffer can easily say, sure, and then never have to follow up. And so we really wanna make it clear they're there to co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act. And so now after you've made that ask, it's a chance to share your stories about why you care about climate change. What is your personal story? Um, think back about an hour ago to the awesome workshop that Leish and Larissa hosted about where everyone was sharing their stories and the different types of stories that you can tell. Um, what is motivating you to participate in this conference this weekend, right? There's lots of other things you can be doing and we're so grateful you're here right now. So why are you here? Why do you care? What's your story? And how does it tie back to the Climate Action Rebate Act? And then it's a chance for you to really ask follow-up questions with the staffer, asking them things like, does the member support the Climate Action Rebate Act? Or do they support pricing carbon more broadly? If not, why not? What are the solutions that the member of Congress does support to address climate change? Does the member hear from constituents very often about the issue, right? So, Think about it, you know, again, you're on the phone and so you might have to do a little bit more prompting than normal um, because you wanna make sure that you're hearing uh, from them too. So if there's an awkward pause or a silence, you might need to specifically say, staffer, whatever their name is, I would really love to hear your opinion on this. Um, so just, just keep that in mind that you won't have the visual cues, you'll have to explicitly ask. So then when it feels like the conversation is wrapping up, maybe the congressional staffer has to leave, remind them of the ask one more time, co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act, thank them for taking the time to speak with you, and let them know that you're going to be following up later that day with an email that includes information about the lobby ask and who all was a part of that meeting. Um, and so as a, as a reminder, you know, we're, we provided this template email for you all to use, um, so you'll be able to very easily um, kind of send them all the information that they need. 
And then don't forget to fill out that lobby visit report back form online. It asks those couple of key questions, which you're really gonna wanna make sure that you can answer. So now um, we're gonna actually demonstrate what a phone call visit might look like. Um, so we're gonna do a little lobby visit role play. I'm gonna pretend to be the congressional staffer who works for Senator Tillis from North Carolina. And my colleagues, Leish and Sergio, are gonna be the constituents who will lobby me. Um, so we're gonna practice our lobby session in just a second. Um, we're gonna um, start the scene just about now. Okay, let's go. I can't believe the line cut out. I'm so happy we got on early, right Sergio? Yes, for sure. I'm glad we both made it onto the call early so that we could check any technical difficulties that could have happened. Um, you're gonna take the lead on this, right? Yeah, definitely. I'm just excited to get started. Hi everyone, uh, it's Emily from Senator Tillis's office. Hi Emily, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, things are super busy here trying to deal with COVID-19 and so everything feels really uncertain, but um, we're adjusting to the new normal. Well, yeah, thank you so much for taking this phone call and it's everything that's going on. Um, we're really excited to talk to you today. So my name is Alicia Cannon and I'm joined by my friend Sergio. I'm from Chapel Hill and Sergio is actually from Durham, so we're both constituents of the Senator's District. And we're here, part of this massive conference of like over 500 young adults lobbying on climate change for the Friends Committee on National Legislation. So we personally, I'm so excited, but I want to, before we get into the meeting, I want to see how much time we have. Oh, thank you so much for checking. Um, I have about 15 minutes. Great. Well, before we got, start talking about carbon pricing, we want to thank the center for his work on promoting peace building and his work through the Ellie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act. It's really important for us and we really thank him for his leadership. Oh, thank you so much for noticing that. Um, that's a really, really important issue for the Senator. So, so thank you for bringing that up. He worked really hard on that issue. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Sergio for him to explain why we're here and why we're talking to you today. Well, hi, Emily, it's Sergio. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today and taking the time. We're here today because, you know, I would like Senator Tillis to co-sponsor Senate Bill 2284, the Climate Action Rebate Act. This bill would place a $15 metric ton price on carbon and it would rise, it, it would rise it a, every year. This bill would also eventually get us to 55% of emission reductions by the year 2030. And I think this would be a great bill for the center to co-sponsor. And it would support and it would, it would take care of communities like the one I live in. Now, I would like to take a time and share with you a brief story about why addressing climate change is important to me. I feel like we have a moral obligation to protect vulnerable communities like the one I grew up in. And we're starting to see that effects of climate change are affecting communities of color like the one I grew up in. And I think this bill will address some of those issues that are arising in these communities. This bill will also help to address the impact on vulnerable communities, but it will also create a dividend that would benefit these communities of color like the one I grew up in. Now I would like to turn it over to Leish, who, liked, who will be sharing another story. Hi, this is Alicia again. Hey. So as a person of faith, I believe we have an obligation to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and protect God's creation. We have a climate emergency. Climate change is already harming people of color and low-income communities disproportionately. And people are suffering abroad because of our inaction. The United States is the greatest historical emitter of greenhouse gases, yet the least responsible are facing the brunt of climate impacts. Like, in no way is that fair or just. So the United States has a moral obligation to address climate change. And that is why I hope your boss co-sponsors the Climate Action Rebate Act. Carbon pricing is supported by many prize winning economists and it's a necessary tool to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So the least responsible stop seeing these climate impacts. Now, I'd love to hear from you, Emily, about what the center's position is on this bill. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing those stories with me. Um, I'll be sure to pass them along to the Senator because he really does wanna know what his constituents care about. I'm actually not familiar with the specific bill that you mentioned, um, so I would have to find it online and read more about it um, before fully giving you an answer about if the senator would support it or not. 
Um, but generally speaking, Senator Tillis does think that the climate is changing and that he thinks we need to do something about it. Um, he also doesn't want our economy destroyed in the process. So he's, he's really concerned with, especially in this time of coronavirus, not supporting any legislation that might harm our economy further. It's Sergio here again, Emily. That's great to hear that he acknowledges that climate change, uh, we need to address the climate crisis. Does the Senator have a stance on carbon pricing? So generally, Senator Tillis doesn't like new taxes. Um, but again, I'd have to look at the specific bill and just learn more about it. Alicia here. Well, can you tell us um, some policies that the Senator does support to address the climate crisis? Sure. So the Senator uh, supports market-based solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, but that will foster innovation and, and also drive further economic growth. So he's really focused on solutions that can help us innovate and um, be able to export clean energy technologies around the globe. Well, that's great to hear because carbon pricing is a market-based solution. And the bill we're here to talk to you about today actually has revenue that goes into R&D and at clean energy innovation, things that I think the Senator would be interested in. It's Sergio again. I have another question. Is climate change an issue the Senator hears from frequently from his constituents? You know, it's actually not a top issue that he hears from people about. I think right now, North Carolinians are, are most concerned about health care and the economy and, and stopping coronavirus. Um, I do think if he heard from more people on climate change, it would rise as a priority for him. Um, but actually, I'm so sorry. I actually have to go. I have to run on to another call. Um, but thank you so much for uh, sharing this information with me today. Well, this is Alicia, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us again amidst everything that's going on. Um, we'd love for Senator Tillis to co-sponsor the Climate Action Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019. And Sergio is going to be sending you a follow-up email with some more information and some resources that we have and a list of the people who are on the call today. We'd love to be able to follow up additionally to see if you had a chance to review the bill in a week. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks Emily. Emily. Bye. 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 And end scene. Okay. Um, so there you have it. Hopefully that role play can at least begin to get your wheels turning about how an effective lobby visit phone call might go. Um, I think it was especially great how Leash and Sergio identified themselves each time before speaking. Um, and they made sure to ask me plenty of questions and gave me time to respond, which I really appreciated because um, I you know, wasn't always sure when it would have been my time to talk otherwise. Um, so great work team, really grateful for you for demonstrating that lobby visit. And I think in a second, I'm going to turn it back to Arissa, um, who will kind of close us out um, for today's portion. Um, so over to you, Larissa. Yes, in a second is right, because first, I have a question for you, Emily. Great. Um, first of all, uh, I think we're getting a little bit of confusion about the roles that you mentioned. Um, uh, are we supposed to be, you know, coming into these trainings knowing what role we want? Is someone going to assign us a role? How is that going to look? Great question. So in just a few minutes, we're going to be breaking out into delegations by our state. So everyone from North Carolina is going to be in a separate conference call. And we're going to have at least an hour where we're going to be able, you're going to be assigned an FCNL staff person who's going to, just like I did, walk you through that roadmap again and as a group, as a state, you're going to assign roles together. So I gave this overview just so everyone has a heads up of kind of what they can be expecting, um, get thinking about if there's a particular role that resonated with you, um, but you're gonna actually all decide collectively um, who's gonna play what role in the lobby visit um, in just a few minutes. So you don't have to have known that already, but thank you for that question. Great. And then also um, you obviously do this for a living and uh, for that reason, I'm sure you've already had a lot of telephone uh, lobby visits or even before all of this happened, maybe you had some experience. So uh, do you have any kind of best practices that maybe you've experienced on your own in your work that you wanna share with everyone since you've already done this before? Yes, that's another great question. Leisha and I actually had a, a phone call lobby visit a couple of days ago um, with a Republican staffer on climate change. And it went really well. It was lovely. Um, he spent almost a half hour with us. I think a couple of things that I learned from that conversation is that we're all human. We're all going through a pretty weird and scary and hard time. Um, and it's okay to take a minute at the beginning of the call to acknowledge that. 
um, you have to remember that you're, you're speaking to another person on the end of that phone line. And just like if you were going to be um, in person, it's okay to just say, like, how are you doing? How are you? Are you, are you working remotely right now? Like what's going on in the office? Um, think we're so grateful for your leadership and work right now. It's a scary time. Um, it's okay to take a pause to just say that. Um, and then I think it's also something else that I learned is that you might have a couple of kind of awkward pauses and it's okay to have plenty of laughter on the call. Um, Lucia and I laughed several times at the congressional staffer when we both started talking at the same time and, and it was okay. He was really nice about it um, and was really excited just to to be able to talk about something different for a few minutes. Um, and so my advice would be at the end of the day, remember that you're talking to another human being um, and that we're all going through this together for the first time. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Leash. And thank you, Sergio, for modeling what a lobby visit is going to look like. Um, like we've all said now, you will get a chance to prepare your own visit and we will make sure that you are totally comfortable before you actually lobby on Tuesday. So for now, I do wanna kind of close us out before we break up into those smaller groups. And again, I will tell you how to do that, don't worry. Um, so we really hope that you have learned and gained new perspectives and more importantly, are getting excited to put all of this training into practice. Right now, uh, you might still have some lingering questions or, or maybe a lot of lingering questions about how your specific lobby visit will go. Um, but like I said, a staffer will take you through it in uh, maybe like 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and we will get to that and make sure that you know how to log in. Um, before that, I do want to go back over what to expect tomorrow. So uh, we're about to wrap up on uh, our time via this webinar, but tomorrow just come back to this exact same place at noon Eastern because we will have a briefing from congressional staff. This panel is gonna be starting at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And we will also have remarks from Representative Panetta, who is one of the original sponsors of the Climate Rebate Action Act of 2019. So the bill that we are lobbying on, uh, we will have uh, one of the original sponsors, Representative Panetta, address us. And I think that's gonna be really exciting. We're working on his bill. And so um, hopefully we can get some good uh, words of wisdom uh, before we start lobbying tomorrow. Uh, the, the words of wisdom tomorrow, lobbying is on Tuesday. <laughs> okay, so at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, that'll be for about an hour, congressional panel, member of Congress speaking to us. 1 p.m. Eastern, we will have workshops. These workshops have really been designed to give you even more advocacy skills and more opportunity to explore some of the intersectionality within the climate crisis issue. Now, there are three slots of workshops with each slot being half an hour. In each half hour slot, you will have the option of three different workshops to attend. So let's go through them. From 1 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, we have Environment, Quakers, and Faith Partners. This will further explore how our faith, Quaker or other, can inform and guide our work on this issue. We also have talking to conservative members of Congress about carbon pricing, which is a pretty straightforward title, I hope, and I would definitely encourage you to go to this workshop if you will be lobbying a more conservative member tomorrow. Maybe you already know that, you're already concerned, uh, go to this workshop and hopefully we can give you some good talk. Finally, from 1 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern, we have Amplify Your Advocacy, Break Into the Media. This workshop will show you how to use the media as an advocacy tool, and our goal is to hopefully get some of you published. Uh, we're going to walk you through how to write an LTE, and if some of you send them off and get published in the next week or so, I think that would be really, really cool. Our next slot is from 1.30 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern. We have three more workshop options, and these are all focused on the intersectionality of climate change with other issues. We have climate change and immigration, climate change and agriculture, and climate change and public health. And like Leish and I were saying earlier when we were talking about storytelling, 
I really think that this lot of workshops, um, if any of those are already kind of getting you really interested in the topic, will be helpful for you to gain more perspective on how to actually form your story. Um, then finally, from 2 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern, we have another intersectionality workshop, climate change and mass incarceration. We also have Show Me the Money, the economics of carbon pricing, which will hopefully satisfy the policy wonks out there or the econ majors uh, who would really like to get into the details of carbon pricing. And finally, we have From the Hill to Your Hometown Advocacy Corps. This workshop will be especially important to attend if you're interested in continuing to lobby back home and actually getting paid to do so. So you've probably heard a couple people already, some of the question askers said that they were either current advocacy core or former advocacy core. These are young adults that we hire every year to organize around one specific issue. Now this year, it will not be on climate change if you do if you are interested and you apply, it will be on immigration, but all of these skills that we're teaching you are transferable and you can advocate on any issue that you want following all of the skills that we've already taught you. So if you're thinking, oh, I wanna get paid to keep doing this type of work, definitely attend this workshop. Um, this is my workshop, which is why I'm talking about it a little bit longer, kind of plugging the advocacy core here. Um, if you are confused about all of the details I just went over, the workshops are listed very clearly on the website. So we've been directing you to this website a lot, fcnl.org slash SLW. If you click on the schedule tab and you go down to the bottom, you will see you know, the regular schedule and then down at the bottom, it will be really clear which videos do you click on in order to view each of the workshops that I just listed out. So hopefully when you're taking a look at those titles, you can kind of remember some of the description I'm giving you and then choose one that's most interesting to you. Okay, huh, we are at the end of our time on this webinar. Oh my goodness, my butt is sore from sitting in this chair for the last three hours, but I am more importantly feeling really inspired and actually challenged. Um, and, and let me explain what I mean by that. You know, in my head, we are all advocates. And I hope that we have now convinced you, or at least maybe you'll be convinced of this on Tuesday, that we are all also lobbyists. But now that we've heard from such great speakers, I'm thinking even more about the influence that we could have if we continue to come together in this way. Dr. Santiago Ali called us thought leaders. He called us change makers. And that got me very excited because I had never really thought of it that way. Um, there is an obvious strength in having hundreds of people lobby on Tuesday for the Climate Rebate Action Act. But there is also a strength in contributing to the movement, to the dialogue, and to the prioritization of this issue. Um, I think, you know, you heard from some of the speakers, some of this is even a culture shift, and it's about continuing to have this conversation. So think of yourself as those thought leaders that uh, Dr. Santiago Ali believes us to be. And you also heard Rachel Cletus and Jamie DeMarco thank us for being here because they also know the power that lies within all of us as individuals, and then especially as a group. And, you know, I hope that you're starting to become convinced of that as well. So at this moment, I want to encourage you to, oh, surprise, surprise, get back on the website, fcnl.org slash SLW. You should probably have an email in your inbox with a more clear link about where you go in order to get trained for your lobbying. But if not, the links that are labeled by state. So whatever state you're in, you wanna lobby in that state, click on that link and then you can uh, get on the video conferencing chat that we have there. And there will be an FCNL staffer waiting for you as well as other people from your state that are waiting there for you. The training should be starting now if you are ready and you can click now, get on now, people should be waiting already. But it's about, you know, in the next like five minutes, I think we're gonna really get started and you'll have a good 
hour with the staffer to make sure that you're comfortable with your visit tomorrow. So I'm going to let you all go. Um, I got some states to train as well. Thank you all so much for being here. I'll see you tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern time and happy training. Bye, everybody.